Committee will now come to order. I want to thank uh, the witnesses for their patience. Uh, the House uh, has just completed its business for the day. So I don't think we'll have any other interruptions. We'll hear from Ms. Jedeke, and then we'll go to questions of the witnesses. And again, I thank you for uh, your indulgence. Chair recognizes Ms. Jedeke. Chairman Kucinich, I'm Ann Jedeke, Deputy Controller for Compliance Policy at the Office of the Controller of the Currency. I'm pleased to appear before you today to discuss the OCC's Fair Lending and Community Reinvestment Act examination processes. I will also discuss how a national bank's CRA evaluation and rating can be adversely affected by evidence of unlawful discrimination. Let me begin by saying there is no room for unlawful lending discrimination in the national banking system and the OCC fully expects banks to serve the credit needs of their communities, including needs in low and moderate income areas. The OCC has a comprehensive and rigorous fair lending oversight program, which is the foundation for ensuring that national banks comply with fair lending laws. We also conduct examinations of national banks to evaluate whether they're meeting the credit needs of their communities as required by the Community Reinvestment Act. At each CRA examination of a national bank, the examiner not only evaluates the manner in which the bank is meeting the credit needs of the community, but the examiner also considers the nature and extent of any unlawful discrimination or other illegal credit practices in which the bank may have engaged. The joint CRA regulations of the federal banking agencies provide that evidence of unlawful discrimination or other illegal credit practices has an adverse effect on a bank CRA evaluation. Therefore, if there is evidence of unlawful discrimination, that information is taken into, an, into account in the bank CRA evaluation, and the examiner's findings are discussed in the public performance evaluation, or PE. The interagency CRA rules further provide guidance on the factors that will be considered in determining whether a bank's CRA rating should be adjusted as a result of such evidence. These factors include, among other things, the nature of the violation, the extent of the problem, whether the bank self-identified the issue, and whether the bank has, has initiated corrective action. Let me assure you that the OCC treats evidence of fair lending violations as a negative factor when assessing the CRA performance of national banks, and we have lowered the CRA ratings of national banks in several instances based on such evidence. For example, ratings have been lowered from outstanding to satisfactory and from satisfactory to needs to improve based on discriminatory or other illegal credit practices. In other instances, the OCC has described the violations in the CRAPE and has taken them into account in evaluating CRA performance, but has determined that lowering a rating was not appropriate based on an assessment of the applicable factors in the regulation. In addition to conducting CRA examinations, the OCC has a fair lending supervisory program designed to assess the level of fair lending risk in every national bank. As part of this process, the OCC assesses compliance with fair lending laws and regulations. We obtain corrective action when significant weaknesses or deficiencies are found in a bank's policies, procedures, and controls related to fair lending, and we ensure that enforcement action is taken when warranted, including referrals to the United States Department of Justice and notifications to the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development. Our fair lending supervisory process has several features that in combination result in a risk-based approach to our fair lending supervision. We combine our examiner's knowledge of the bank and its products and markets with analytical information about loans made by the bank and with information from consumers and community groups. Using this information, we focus our fair lending examinations on banks that show the greatest potential for fair lending issues. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss the important nexus between fair lending and helping to meet community credit needs. The OCC is committed to ensuring that our evaluation of National Bank's CRA performance appropriately reflects any evidence of unlawful discrimination consistent with the interagency CRA regulations. Along with our robust fair lending examination and enforcement process, the CRA process is an important tool in federal law that we use to address and to prevent unlawful discrimination. I'll be pleased to answer any questions that you may have.
Thank you very much for your testimony, uh, Ms. Jedeke. Uh, we're pleased to, to be joined by uh, Mr. Davis of Illinois. Thank you uh, for being here and for your participation. I want to uh, start off with Ms. Thompson. Uh, Ms. Thompson, in a meeting, uh, FDIC representatives told my staff that they are not proud of their failure to note uh, Centir's discriminatory practices. Would you agree that this is the FDIC's general attitude towards Centir as an example, or towards the Centir example? Mr. Chairman, as the head of supervision and consumer protection, I can assure you that that is the FDIC's position on how we handle that particular situation. And um, M Ms. Brownstein, my staff's experience with the Fed was a lot different. Uh, during their meeting, a Fed representative told uh, my staff that the Fed did not make any mistakes in their CRA examination of Old Kent Bank. This is despite the Department of Justice prosecution against Old Kent Bank for FHA and ECOA violations. Uh, I was reading Bloomberg News accounts of this um, meeting today, and you're quoted as saying, if this quote is accurate, that banks can always do more. Uh, is your position that Old Kent Bank could have done more, that is by following the law, or that in the Fed's view, Old Kent Bank was compliant uh, with the CRA? Congressman, um, that incident took place eight years ago, and the institution no longer exists. Um, the people who were involved in that matter at that time no longer work for the Federal Reserve. And it is frankly impossible for me to reconstruct what took place at that time to really opine one way or another. I will tell you that based on the circumstances that ensued, we find the situation to be very troubling. And we do take redlining very seriously and we have proven that um, with our record of referrals to justice for redlining cases. You know, we are not hesitant to pull the trigger when we identify redlining. It is very um, difficult. It's basically impossible for me to address the specific facts well, of the well, old but, Kent but case you're familiar, because you're I don't familiar have with the case. I am familiar with what we know at this time about the ratings. I don't have the benefit of talking to the examiners to find out how they made their judgments. Can, can you say that? Can you say that old? Papers. Can you say that old Kent Bank was misgraded? I would have to try to reconstruct how they came to that conclusion, and I don't think that I can reconstruct their thought processes from eight years ago. Well, you, you said I a also moment don't ago. think that you it's a, a fair it represent, representation to yeah. take one case out of thousands of bank exams we well, use and but, you know, try to characterize our entire record. Uh, this isn't about characterizing your entire record, although your entire record is in question here. Uh, it's about trying to see how the Fed responds when questioned about a specific case, which seems to be uh, quite an egregious uh, example of a, of a lack of, of oversight. Now, I will take into consideration that this was eight years ago, that the institution is gone, that the players are gone. But it would be instructive for this committee to be able to learn from the Fed. Should it have been done differently? Would you do it differently? Or, or don't you know enough about it to make an uh, assessment, which to me would mean that we still are in the lessons learned, or, or the, uh, we're still in the category of lessons to be learned. So, so help us out, please. 
Well, I don't think I know enough about that specific case to make a determination. However, I will tell you that we are constantly looking at ways to improve our processes around, uh, around examinations for Community Reinvestment Act as well as fair lending. We constantly tweak our procedures. Um, we constantly try to find ways to improve. As I said this morning, that bank, there's always room for banks to improve. There's certainly always room for us to improve. So the Fed and can I always, would Fed you can always do more. And I would commit to continue doing that. Is it, would you then agree with the statement the Fed could always do more? Absolutely. Okay. I, I'm Absolutely. My, thank you. My uh, five minutes has expired. Uh, I want to go to Mr. Uh, Davis for the next round of questions. Uh, Chair recognize Mr. Davis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I want to thank the uh, witnesses for being here and for participating. Um, the Department of Justice filed a complaint against First National Bank of Pontotoc, Mississippi in April of 2006, alleging that First National's former vice president violated the Equal Credit Opportunity Act and that the bank is responsible for the discriminatory conduct, conduct during the vice president's tenure. The complaint alleged that while he was serving as the vice president, at First National in 2003 and 4, he had sought sexual favors in return for a favorable loan decision. He left the bank in May of 2004. During this time, between 1993 and 2003, the OCC gave First Bank passing scores even as the Vice President in question was stepping down. In fact, the 2004 CRA exam of First National states that in the, and I quote, fair lending or other illegal credit practices review, end of quote, an analysis of public comments and consumer complaint information was performed according to the OCC's risk-based fair lending approach. Based on its analysis of the information, the OCC decided that a comprehensive fair lending examination would not need to be conducted in connection with the CRA evaluation this year. The latest comprehensive fair lending examination was performed in 1998. I'd like to ask uh, you, Mr. Dickey, you did uh, not conduct a fair lending exam of First National because your agency felt that the risk-based approach that you used, as a result, there was no need for an exam. Is that correct? Yes, sir, at the time. Yes, sir, at the time, based on the information we had during our 2004 CRA exam. Uh, and let me add that the, the issues at First National Bank of Pontotoc are quite disturbing to us, um, but the allegations surrounding the bank emerged contemporaneously with the exam that we were doing in 2004. Shortly thereafter, the Department of Justice opened up an investigation and asked us to stand down. So when the Department of Justice finishes their investigation and we have their findings, we'll take them into account as part of the next CRA examination. Could you explain to us what your risk-based approach is? Certainly. Our fair lending supervision process really has three features. The first is, is the knowledge and experience that our bank examiners have with the banks that they supervise, and that involves the bank's products and services, its customer base, the type of communities they operate in, the type of complaints they're receiving from consumers or community groups. The examiners process that information as they receive it, and if based on any of that information they decide that they're concerned about a fair lending issue, they could initiate a fair lending exam. That's the first feature. The second feature of our fair lending supervisory process is, is really analytically based. Um, we process information from the HMDA data submitted by banks each year and additional information that lets us screen the population of national banks to look for banks that may have um, disparate issues or issues that cause us concern, uh, ask, raise questions about fair lending. If we find that, we'll put those banks on a list to be examined in the coming year. And the third feature is a random sample. We select a group of banks to be examined in the coming year, each year, so that there are banks that, if we perhaps have no other reason to look at those banks for fair lending issues, are examined anyway. 
And, and, and is the fair lending exam meant to be complaint based that as a result of complaints you determine it, it's not so no sir it's not solely complaint based but certainly if we had complaints or information from community groups that caused us concern it could it could um, initiate a fair lending exam so the purpose of the exam is to regulate the banks and ensure that they are in compliance with fair lending laws like the FHA and the ECOA, if you wait for a consumer to tell you what they are in violation of those laws, um, then is your job just to follow up? I'm, I'm saying if you get complaints and the consumers are saying, we think that they are violating thus and so, is it your task to just follow up? We certainly would follow up if we had complaints like that, but that's not the sole basis um, that might lead to a concern on our part around fair lending issues. Um, I'll give you another example. If a national bank were to choose to enter a new market that would involve lending to um, uh, a Hispanic customer base or an African American customer base, and we had reasons to be concerned about the products they were offering, that might cause an examiner to initiate a fair lending exam. Again, if we saw information in the HMDA data filed by national banks every year um, that caused us to be concerned, and we analyze that information every year, that could cause us to initiate a fair lending exam. There are a variety of different things that could occur that would cause us to initiate a fair lending exam. And finally, let me just ask you, is it possible that because uh, there had not been a fair lending exam in six years for this particular bank, uh, before the case was brought to the Department of Justice's attention that First National may be violating other lending laws, but you just weren't aware of them because there was no examination of the bank. Um, I think in the situation of First National Pontotoc, which is a bit unusual because it involves sexual harassment, and, and sexual harassment by its very nature is surreptitious. It would, be, it would be an issue that would be quite difficult for us to uncover as part of, of a bank examination. Nonetheless, um, once the Department of Justice concludes its investigation, we'll review the findings of that investigation, take them into consideration in our next CRA exam, and if there are other indications in that investigation of something we feel like we need to look at at First National Bank of Pontotoc from a fair lending standpoint, we'll do that. So there may be others, but you just really wouldn't know because of the nature of, of, of the examination. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, and Chairman, I want to thank you for your indulgence. I know that my time has ended. Uh, we're going to uh, go to we're going to go to another round of questions. Um, I'm, I'm uh, continue to be concerned about the Fed's uh, approach to enforcement. Uh, we've uh, just reviewed the fact that uh, the old Kent Bank case was uh, eight years old. The Fed is at eight years, a lot of time to learn from experience. Now the 97, 99, and 01 exams had virtually the same language on Old Kent's compliance with anti-discrimination laws. Uh, here's how it reads. The bank is in compliance with the substantive provisions of anti-discrimination laws and regulations, including the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, ECOA, and the Fair Housing Act. No substantive violations were noted. The bank is also in compliance with the technical requirements of the Community Reinvestment Act. The public file and CARA notices uh, were reviewed and deemed to be in compliance. Uh, Ms. Bronstein. Uh, who oversaw the work of this CRA examiner? Um, the CRA examination was done by the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. 
and as is all, all the exam work is done by the reserve banks. And there are various layers of management over those examiners. There are certainly layers of management at the reserve bank itself as well as um, examinations are a delegated function in the Federal Reserve System, so ultimately report into Washington, D.C. So, so the structure of, of oversight, you have the examiner mm -hmm. and then someone who reviews the work of the examiner, who would that be? Correct. That would be probably a reviewing person at the Reserve Bank. And then who would check that work? I would imagine their management, um, whether it's a vice president of the Reserve Bank, a manager, a C, uh, assistant vice president, would, depending, each Reserve Bank has a different hierarchy. So uh, is there a, an oversight body involved here in uh, reviewing an examiner's conclusion? Um, well, yes, absolutely on every examination. Also, I will add that the examinations ultimately come into Washington and that people I at the board do review a portion of those examinations looking for consistency and making sure policies are now being enforced. Now, in, in this particular case, uh, the record shows that the examiner's conclusion was not questioned by a federal oversight body, that it basically concurred. Why was this examiner's conclusion, which I had recited to you earlier, not questioned by a Fed oversight body? Well, I don't know that it wasn't. If, if a conclusion is questioned, it doesn't mean that that would necessarily show up in the report. What you see in the report is the final conclusion. That doesn't preclude that there was some discussion. And there again, it's nothing that I can reconstruct to tell you whether that happened or not. But I also just want to add that our examiners undergo very rigorous training specifically in CRA and fair lending. That is a specialty at the Fed. These examiners are doing consumer compliance work. They are not doing safety and soundness work. They are trained. There is always a degree of subjectivity and judgment that goes into these examinations. And we train our examiners. Um, we continue to, we have continuing training for them. And at some point we have to trust their judgment. We do discuss, management does discuss conclusions with them. And so that would not necessarily show up in the report, but it doesn't mean it didn't go on. Yeah, I, I, I would, um, I would like uh, you to look at this map now. Mm -hmm. And we've described the map to you earlier. Uh, would you call this reasonable? Well, I, I can't see what the legend is over there, what the colors. The, yeah, the, the red area is no mean. branches. I'm sorry? The, the red area represents no branches. Okay. And it also happens to be the city of Detroit. And, and I, let, me, let, me, uh, let me refresh your memory. Uh, about the about the context of this, okay? Uh, you see a, a donut hole around the city of Detroit, mm -hmm. which is 81% African American. The Department of Justice filed suit against Old Kent Bank in 2004 for violating the Fair Housing Act and the Equal Credit Opportunity Act. The Department of Justice cited a Section 228 violation and said, quote, instead of defining its assessment area in accordance with Regulation BB, Old Kent Bank circumscribed its lending area in the Detroit MSA to exclude most of the majority African American neighborhoods by excluding the city of Detroit. And as of uh, March 2000, Old Kent did not have a single branch in the city of Detroit. Now, I'm contrasting that with um, uh, the statement that the Fed made with regard to Old Kent's 
compliance with anti discrimination laws these are from quotes from the ninety seven ninety nine and zero one exam quote the bank is in compliance with the substantive provisions of anti discrimination laws and regulations including the equal credit opportunity act and the fair housing act no substantive violations were noted the bank is also in compliance with the technical requirements of the CRA. The public file and CRA notices were reviewed and deemed to be in compliance. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm going to ask you again. Uh, look at the map. Would you, would, you, would you call it reasonable? I find it very troubling. But again, I don't, there are other things that go into the consideration of an assessment area, such as the banks, what is reasonable for the bank to be serving con considering the location of its branches. Um, uh, like I, I say, I'm gonna I don't have, have to. I'm gonna have to stop you a minute. Mm -hmm. I want you to look with your eyes, okay? And then I want you to look with your heart and see if you can tell me when you look at that Everything, you've got an African-American population there in the city of Detroit that corresponds neatly with what's in red. And then you've got the rest of the area in terms of, of assessments. And you see where the, um, where the CRA, it said th they're in compliance, and, and they're clearly not if you look at the map. Now well, like I say, I find this very troubling, and I will say this. If this was to come before me, today on an exam that we were doing, I would have serious questions about it. Would you say this is what redlining looks like? It certainly could, yes. Did the Fed refer the old Kent case to the Department of Justice? No, it did not. And why didn't the Fed take any of its enforcement actions before then? That I cannot answer. And, and why didn't the Fed at least hold a public hearing during any one of its CRA exams? Well, are you talking about applications? Is when I'm we talking would hold about. Public I'm meetings. talking about during the process of an examination review of the CRA. We don't hold public hearings during examinations. Uh, that's the point. We hold public meetings during applications. Well, I'm okay. I'm t I am yes. talking about applications. Okay. We hold, and I will tell you, on, in that sense, I know in terms of the fifth third application, generally in any application. We are looking most closely at the record of the acquiring institution because especially if there are problems with the target and the acquiring institution has a good record, um, we have conversations with them to make sure that they are going to bring the target institution up to the standards that they currently have. Now your, your enforcement authority under the CRA is the ability to assign a low rating which would impede a banking institution's ability to expand by merging with other banks, acquiring other companies, and branching. You didn't exercise that authority when you examined uh, old, uh, old Kent, but you had another chance to exercise your authority when old Kent applied to merge with Fifth Third Bank. Did you hold a public hearing to discuss the merger? No, we did not. Uh, there's a couple things there. One is the Justice Department investigation was still underway, so we had absolutely no idea of what their findings were at that time. Um, also, as I said before, we are looking much more closely at the acquiring institution rather than the target in Fifth Third was the acquiring institution. Did, did you see the map though? Did anybody look at the map and, and you know, I mean, let's set aside the Department of Justice for we, a minute. During an application, we generally look at the exams. The exams definitely figure in to the process, mm -hmm. the previous examinations. And, and uh, so you didn't hold a public, you did or didn't hold a public hearing? We did not hold a public okay. meeting in that case. And did you condition Fifth Third's acquisition on serving Detroit? As far as I know, we did not. Okay. Why didn't you do that? I don't know. I cannot answer that. I mean, you, you, you could have done that. Is that correct? Do you have the power to do that? To condition? We do have the power to condition an acquisition. An acquisition. So, so you had the power to condition an acquisition 
on serving a population which by, the, by just a quick look at a map, you could tell that, um, uh, that there was redlining going on and, and you didn't do it. Now, um, did you solicit feedback from the community to decide what the acquiring bank would uh, need to do to better serve the community? With any application, we have a public comment process. And, and what about the public comment process on, on that uh, particular case? Did you go out to the community? You, you, you didn't hold hearings, you said, but how, how was the public able to know that there was an opportunity to comment? Oh, there's the, um, anytime there's an application, it's advertised in community groups or anybody, citizens, whoever, other financial institutions, anybody can file public comments with us. And, and how, are, how, are, how are people advised of that? Um, we, it's, there's a newspaper notice, there's, you know, generally it's never been a problem for people to know about that. Did you, did you take out newspaper ads in the African American community to let people know that they could I comment? I am not aware of exactly what, where it was advertised at that time. Would it be, that was it a would number be of years ago. I think, I think it would be instructive. I, I mean, let, let, let me make clear something for those who, who are uh, in the audience and, and may be watching. Uh, that staff has has met uh, with uh, the Fed, and there really aren't any surprises that we're going in depth here into talking about old, old Kent. This is not something that we're just pulling out of a hat. This is a this is a very serious question that that is is quite blatant. And of course, uh, as a personal concern, I know Mr. Mr. Davis, who represents Chicago, has a personal concern here, and I share it. Uh, but we also have a situation in Cleveland where we see people couldn't get loans. They're thrown into subprimes. They end up not being able to meet the requirements. They lose their homes. And we've got whole neighborhoods that are being uh, decimated. Um, and, 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 you know, the public policy issue here, frankly, is one where if, if banks are permitted to avoid the requirements of the CRA and then at the, uh, and, and people can't get the loans, they then get thrown into the clutches of subprime lenders the most predatory of lenders out there. And then they're going to get destroyed financially and lose their homes. So to go back to the Fed, do you understand why this committee uh, it feels the Fed has a, a, a not only a legal obligation here, but a moral obligation to the people of the United States to, to exact oversight in a manner which insists compliance with the letter of the law. Do you, do you understand why this committee has, has a concern uh, about the, the imperative of, of, of Fed enforcement here? Um, Congressman, we share that concern. We take these matters extremely seriously. And we have shown that through our fair lending record, our record of referrals to justice. Like I say, I cannot explain how this case happened, but we have not hesitated to pull the trigger when we have found redlining in other financial institutions. It's not like we have no record of pulling the trigger on cases like this. Well, you know, um When you look at the wreckage that subprime loans are leaving in neighborhoods across America, and when you look at the lack of, the apparent lack of effective oversight of CRA, because if people had the money, if they got the loans from the prime lenders, whose responsibility it is under CRA, they wouldn't have been thrown into the arms of the subprime lenders. That's the point. And, and, and with all due respect, and, I, and, and again, I'm very grateful that you're here. 
we, we couldn't do this hearing without you. But we also can't have an effective oversight without the Fed's active participation. And at this point, uh, notwithstanding your, your profession of concern, the, a quantitative assessment does not rest in your favor. And, the, and, and while the Fed and all of the members of the Fed can go home tonight and rest easy in their townhouses and their apartments and in their homes, as they should be able to do, there are millions of Americans who maybe are losing their homes and who are out of their homes, and some of them on the street. This is not a small matter. The chair recognizes Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Bronstein, let me um, ask about voluntary corrective action as, as a – does this regulation suggest that if a bank corrects its discriminatory behavior, then the regulator will not reflect the discriminatory practice in the CRA exam? Um, no, it does not suggest that at all. In fact, if even if a bank um, corrects its behavior, if there was a pattern or practice of discrimination, we have reason to believe that there was, despite a correction, we will make a referral to justice. We also will reflect the discrimination in the public evaluation of the CRA report. So you're not grading the bank based on its performance exactly, are you? Or, or is it some performance and some of what it says it's going to do? Well, there's a difference between the, I'm trying to, I think, I'm not sure I understood your question, but there's a difference between the CRA rating that is given and the public evaluation report. The rating is part of the report. So I think what we're saying, and this is true of all of us, is that in some cases a finding of discrimination may not result in a downgrading of the rating. However, even if that happens, it will be reflected in the written report on CRA. Well, let me ask you, if a bank like Old Kent says in 2001, we're sorry, we'll open up a branch in the city of Detroit, even though we haven't done so as of yet. Um, we're legally mandated to do for the past five years. Would this bank get a lower CRA rating, or would this satisfy the requirement? If we find a red redlining violation, um, first of all, we would be mandated to refer that to justice. And second of all, something that egregious would likely result in a downgrade in the CRA rating. And, and let me go to other members of the panel. Of course, we have data that reveal a disproportionate share of African American assessment, um, African American and Latinos receiving higher rate home loans, um, notwithstanding location, um, income. We see non-disclosure of fair lending exams and lack of transparency, thereby compromising entire communities of their right to participate in public negotiations and CRA's lack of uniform standards where reasonableness of assessment area as well as nature, extent, and strength of evidence of discriminatory practices are at the discretion of the examiner. Um, I guess what I'm really trying to arrive at is this business of when is enough enough or how do you decide? The question then becomes, 
what level of evidence is sufficient to adversely impact an agency's CRA evaluation? And Ms. Thompson, perhaps I would start. Well, a couple of things. Um, at the FDIC, consumer protection is very important. And not only do we look at access to credit, which was um, very relevant 30 years ago, and it's just as relevant today, we look at cost of credit, because in many of the low income and moderate income neighborhoods, uh, they are proliferated by high cost credit products that may or may not be offered by financial regulated entities, such as uh, financial institutions. At the FDIC, we're encouraging um, unbanked and underserved persons to come into the banking sector. And through our examination process, we think one violation is one too many, and we always advise the bank to take corrective action. To the extent that we find patterns and practices of either denial of credit or high cost credit, we take action relatively quickly and we take that information and we factor it into the rating for the compliance exam for that institution and also the CRA rating. This year alone the FDIC has made 13 referrals to the Department of Justice for fair lending issues and we've also downgraded two institutions in 2007 um, with respect to their CRA rating. This is something that is very important to the FDIC. It's important to our chairman, and we want to ensure that our examiners take corrective action where appropriate. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Yakumov. How would you respond to that? Uh? We look at the fair lending record of our institutions very closely. We look at the HMDA data. We combine it with factors that aren't included in the HMDA data, like loan to value, the broker compensation, um, um, credit score, and fair lending reviews take place at every comprehensive exam, every 12 to 18 months. Um, we do targeted reviews. We've, as I said, we've built some, some additional models and tools to kind of run the data through. And again, if we see evidence of discrimination or other illegal credit practices, that will have an impact. Not, not only will that be reflected in the fair lending evaluation, but it will also have an impact on the, the CRA rating. And we look again at the scope of the evidence. We look at the CRA performance of the institution uh, in totality, but that's a, that's a significant factor if we do find those concerns. Mr. Baker. Congressman. Congressman, findings of illegal credit practices or discrimination adversely affect the CRA ratings of national banks. But equally important, a poor lending record by a national bank or, or a bank that is not serving the credit needs of its community, including low and moderate income areas, is equally likely to get an, adversely, an adverse CRA rating. You know, I'm always um, amazed that in spite of the fact that we've had CRA now for 30 years, um, and yet, <laughs> when we look at certain communities in certain areas, um, we don't seem to get a tremendous amount of difference in some of those. You're saying the same groups continue to have the most difficult time, still continue to pay the most, for credit, still seem to not be able to acquire, in many instances, decent credit. Um, is there something else that any of you might be able to think of that might be missing? I, I mean, I happen to actually live in the community that was a hotbed of the generation of activity that resulted in CRA. A uh, woman named Gail Sincata used to live in the same neighborhood where I live. As a matter of fact, I was a member of Gail Sincata's first organization, the Organization for a Better Austin, before she left and came to Washington and organized the National Training and Information Center. And so I've kind of seen this over the period of time. 
what, what else could, could happen if there's anything? Congresswoman, I, I happen to be privileged to have been born and raised on the south side of Chicago, so I will, um, which is the home of CRA, as you well know. But I can tell you that at the FDIC, we take a very proactive approach to economic inclusion. We have with, um, within our organization a concerted effort to try to bring the unbanked and underserved persons that uh, the chairman referenced in his opening statement into the banking sector. In eight of our uh, territories, we have formed alliances with community groups, financial institutions, and other regulators to try to find out why people are not coming into the banking system, and we're trying to figure out ways to encourage them to participate more fully in the financial services that are offered by regulated entities because, again, so often in these communities, many um, of the occupants are subject to higher cost products, whether it's financial services or not. This is a very important initiative to our chairman, and we do uh, take proactive steps to try to encourage the regulators to work with uh, community groups and financial institutions to try to better address that, this issue. Um, yeah, Congressman, I, I, I would also add to that that I don't think we should lose sight of the fact of the, the accomplishments of CRA over the last three years. Um, it has been documented differently in different places, but I don't think anyone would argue that CRA has brought billions of dollars into neighborhoods that previously had very little, if any, bank investment or bank participation. Um, I do believe there is a lot more to be done and um, needs to be done both on the part of the regulators as well as on the part of the financial institutions. Um, I also think that unfortunately CRA is not the panacea or the answer to everything, all the problems that exist economically in low income communities and it will never be able to solve all the problems. <coughs> I'd add We've seen a real democratization in credit, and I think it's incumbent upon us for both sides of our houses to, to function effectively. So we're talking a lot about CRA and the provision of credit, particularly to low and moderate income people. We want the types of credit that are sustainable, that allow people to, s to stay in their homes. So we need to make sure that underwriting is what it ought to be. Um, that's another part of what we're called upon to do, and I think we've issued guidance in the last, m you know, more than a year recently and going back to 2006 that really began to move the industry into what our <coughs> expectations were in terms of sound underwriting. They're both, both important. I'd add to that, I think it's very important for us as regulators to help keep the dialogue going between banks and community groups. I know at the OCC in the last five years, we've held a thousand meetings between, uh, with, with different community groups um, around the country trying to understand what the needs are so that we can make better assessments in our CRA exams and we can help banks understand um, what communities need. I also think financial literacy is always an important issue and to the extent that we can contribute as regulators in those areas, I think we should. And I think we need to closely look at what's happening in the subprime market and in the environment we're working in now to see if we can learn how people are being affected by the current environment. Well, let me just thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Let me thank all of you. I know I'm going to have to dash away to something else, but I do want to say that I, I would certainly agree relative to some of the impact that CRA has actually had. Even from a personal experience, I actually sat on the board of a bank for 10 years as a result of my community being engaged to the extent that we held up the, the, the purchase of a bank until there was agreement with our reinvestment policy. And uh, it has been a good experience. And I actually sat there with no personal interest in the bank. I didn't own any of the stock and only left after I got elected to Congress because I wouldn't have time <laughs> to go to the meetings and all. And so, yeah, I think that CR CRA has had some impact, can have even more, 
and I think an activated community is probably one of the best things that I really can think of to help make sure that the concept really works. And so I thank you all, and I thank you, Mr. Chairman, again, for your indulgence. Uh, Mr. Davis, uh, it's uh, an honor to have you on this subcommittee because uh, you and I share a, a passionate commitment to uh, people in urban areas, and these economic issues are fundamental to people's survival. Now, I just heard uh, Ms. Uh, Jedeke talk about financial literacy, and you know, it's a generally accept accepted provision in a marketplace to say, caveat emptor, let the buyer beware. Uh, people buy credit. When you consider the fact that bankruptcies are at an all-time high in the United States, that foreclosures at, uh, are at an all-time high. This isn't just a question of financial literacy. This is really goes to the heart of why we've asked the regulators to come before this subcommittee. This is a question of your responsibility. No one questions the efficacy of the Community Reinvestment Act. I was one of the first mayors in the United States to use the Community Reinvestment Act almost 30 years ago to, to benefit, uh, 29 years ago, to benefit a, a neighborhood in the city of Cleveland. So it's, you know, the efficacy of the Community Reinvestment Act is not, not at issue here. We have a, a crisis in America with people getting tricked, having their lives ruined by predatory lenders and by prime lenders who are not fulfilling their obligations under the Community Reinvestment Act because the regulators don't make them do it. Now, I just want to go down, the, and so thank you, Mr. Davis. I just want to go down the panel here, start with Ms. Thompson. When is a, a discriminatory practice egregious enough to result in a CRA failure? What does it take? Well, we think uh, one discrimination is one too many, and we do look at the institution's record with regard to their lending practices to persons, and we try to determine whether or not it's a pattern or practice, and we do require institutions to take corrective action. Uh, in, at the FDIC, we do have a number, we have four institutions that are substantially non-compliant with regard to their CRA rating, and we've got about 31 that are in the needs to improve category. Uh, lending and discrimination is something that we take very seriously at the FDIC. We have an extensive training program where we train our examiners to look at fair lending issues, to look at uh, community reinvestment, to talk to people in communities and get as much information as we can. The CRA rating is a huge reputational issue for an institution and we want to make sure that we have all the facts that we possibly can to make a decision. Um, again, we take pride in our examination program, and even one violation is one too many. I, I, I appreciate you saying that. I'm going to ask staff here, um, in, in light of some of these comments, and, and maybe you're already working on doing this, to, to look at the, um, the issue of mergers and acquisitions, the growth of the value of banks during the period that, uh, that's under study here, to see how uh, uh, banks have been able to, um, to increase their, their wealth, their holdings, while we've seen a commensurate decline in the ability of people in the inner cities to get credit. I want to take a look at that. And, and so I'd, I'd just to uh, uh, continue, I'd like, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I just, I, I want to go back to uh, Ms. Brownstein. What takes a, a applicant to the point of failure? Wh when is a discriminatory practice egregious enough to result 
in a CRA failure? What does it take? Well, I can't, there is no specific measurement of that, but um, I will tell you when we look at their CRA evaluation, we are looking at the totality of them serving the convenience and needs of their communities. Um, as part of that, we do look at whether or not there is, there are findings of discrimination. There are cases, we're talking here in the case of a redlining um, case where there is, that would be a very egregious case. However, you know, we find discrimination on things like spousal signatures that were required that shouldn't have been, which is also serious and we make referrals to justice on this. And that may show up in the evaluation, but if it took place in a very small part of the institution, maybe with a rogue loan officer, and it is a large institution, and otherwise it is doing a good job of serving its community, it could be that that CRA rating is not downgraded in right, that case. Right, right. Uh, you know, uh, spousal signatures, okay. What about race? Racial discrimination, I would, we would look at very closely and, and see it's, I would think that would result in a downgrading. I can't sit well, here well, as I was sworn in and, and say that, that, that there was no other, there's no possibility of a case where that would not, you know, where that would not uh, yeah, result I, in a downgrade. I just, uh, look, uh, students in class, um, mm -hmm. sorry, uh, your work's not good enough. Uh, we can't give you a C, we're going to get downgrade you to a D. Or, students in class, sorry, you fail. There is a world of difference, is there not, between an institution being downgraded and failed on a uh, CRA examination? There is absolutely a big difference. You want to explain to the committee what the difference is between being downgraded and being well, failed. you could be downgraded from an outstanding to a satisfactory, and you're still getting a passing rating. Right. So, like, but if being you're downgraded failed, from an A to a B. If you're failed, you if know, when failed somebody fails, somebody fails a test in a school, mm -hmm. they they don't pass the grade. Mm -hmm. What happens when someone fails a CRA examination? Uh, well, it is publicly available information, so it causes you know, a problem for them in that area. Like, As for example? Well, it's, for one thing, it's, it's an embarrassment to the institution mm -hmm. publicly. It also does cause them problems in the application process, which I'm sure is what right, you're getting at. Right, right, right. So what, and so if it causes someone, you know, let's take this along, if it causes someone a problem in their act, in their application process, what does that mean? Spell it out a little bit. What could be the implications? Well, the applicant. implications would be that it would be much more difficult for them to expand their operations. To? Expand their operations. Right. And uh, so, really, it, it would limit their growth, correct? It could, could result in that. It would be a factor that would be considered, and it would make the hurdle rate much higher right, right. for them to get an application approved. So what does it take? What, what would someone have to do to, to really fail? I... It's in every bank is for one thing we don't do CRA on a bell curve, so we look at each bank in and of itself. So it's pass fail. No, it's not. It's not pass a curve. Fail. What is it? Is it pass fail? No, it could be. You know, as is the case, most people pass. We're not guaranteeing that there are going to be so many failures and so many A's on the other end of the curve. And it is. This is a rating that is done by looking at the totality of the banks serving their, their community credit needs. And depending on the size of the institution, that would also make a big difference. Okay, you know, if you have one of these huge national institutions and they have a problem in one little market and then in the other 150 markets they're serving, they're doing just fine, how much do you weigh that? I mean, those are, they're subjective that, judgments. Well, that, that's very interesting because let's say, you know, an institution had uh, a little problem in Detroit, let's say, and you know, 81 percent African American population in the city. All of a sudden, credit dries up. They're serving the rest of the area very well. Um, nationally, with uh, interstate banking, 
conceivable. Someone could look at an inner city area and be out of it. Serve every place else very well. Well, you know, we just move on. See, this is what I'm concerned about because, you know, everyone on the panel here, uh, you only failed 225 banks out of 60,000 plus banks evaluated in the past 17 years. And here we have a massive wave of foreclosures going on. There's a connection. This committee's determined to get to the connection. And, and someone's got to take responsibility here. We have all the regulators here. Now, I, 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 I'm uh, taking, I wanna, I wanna taking discrimination out of it, it is not surprising that most banks pass CRA, considering it's been around for 30 years, and they know what it is that they're supposed to do at this time. In that sense, that is not a surprising statistic. When they're told the same thing over and over again, most banks get it in terms of CRA at, at this point in time. Now, you could postulate that there is something inherently wrong with CRA that banks should, you know, could pass. But it is what it is, and most banks do get it. And after 30 years, as with most other parts of the examination, whether it's safety and soundness or otherwise, banks know what they're supposed okay, to we're do. Okay, we're going we're to move on, but I just want to make a comment. This is a copy of the Constitution of the United States. Now, taking the 13th and 14th Amendment out of this, there's a lot of people that could pass muster in a lot of reviews, but there's a reason why, why we have protections under the law. There's a reason why the Department of Justice will inevitably have to go after someone because the underpinnings of someone's failing a review is a violation of someone's civil rights. So I, I want to go to uh, uh, Ms. Yakimov here. Uh, what is a discriminatory practice? When is it egregious enough to result in a CRA failure? We would look at the institution's fair lending record. Uh, we would look at whether or not we found a pattern of practice, material fair lending concerns. That would be assessed in our fair lending exam, which is kind of a, a separate function from the CRA exam, but it, they connect at the point we're looking at the institution's record of meeting the, the credit needs, the financial services needs of its community. So we look at its lending performance, its penetration, how much lending does it do in its assessment area, how many investments, how many services, depending on the size of the institution. We look at their their CRA performance within all of that context and, and then look at whether or not we found uh, problems with their lending or other illegal credit practices. And if we find that, and in 37 cases since 1990 at OTS, we have had these downgrades, um, many to um, needs to improve or uh, even uh, worse. So you it's, you it's don't You don't want to fail them, though, do you? Well, no, I, I wouldn't. I, I, d I don't think that's the case. I think our examiners, if they identify um, failure to meet the credit needs, failure to meet the needs of its community within the CRA context, failure to abide by the fair lending laws, that absolutely is something that we wouldn't hesitate to, to, to act upon and to downgrade the institution. And you know, so we would look, we would look at their, their whole record. And you know, we try to take all that into context. You know, you see, wh what strikes me in this testimony so far is that uh, there seems to be an, an aversion to talking about failure that could be one of the underlying reasons why we've ended up with so many foreclosures with, this, with, the, Im with the proliferation of the subprime market with prime lenders not having to abide by the letter of the CRA that it all fits in together because you just don't want to talk about failure because there's some kind of a, a culture here uh, that regulators have. And this isn't, by the way, this isn't the cast version on this group of regulators because we know in many areas that the, um, uh, that industries have enormous influence in regulatory processes all across the economy. So it isn't just like there's a, a, a massive uh, um, disconnection here. In a sense, there's a consistency. 
and, and we appreciate you being forthcoming, as you are, to try to help us work it out. Now, I, I would like to- Co Congressman, uh, we did downgrade First American Bank for redlining to substantial noncompliance. Well, there you go again, Which is the lowest, ba see, lowest see, rating. The, you know, th there's a difference between downgrading and failing, because what happened to it? That failed them. That's the failing mm -hmm. grade. Excuse me. Okay, that, that was a failure, thank you. Yes. The, I want to go back to Ms. Yakimov. Um, I want to ask you about the Flagstar case. Okay. You had a CRA examiner award Flagstar a satisfactory grade when a court found Flagstar liable for discriminatory practices against minority borrowers. Mm -hmm. Now, even, is, is, that, is that true? Yes. Okay, now, how, how was your CRA examiner able to give uh, a satisfactory grade to Flagstar? How did that right. happen? It's, it's, a, it's a more than legitimate question. It's a good question. And uh, I'll share with you what I pieced together as we looked through the exam reports and so forth. And this is in the public uh, performance evaluation. Sorry, I'm kind of a little feedback here. Here, our examiners identified a strong CRA record in, in Flagstar. And I'll just give you a couple of examples of the things that they identified in the, 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 P, the, the performance evaluation. One was um, th they originated $26.3 million in community development loans. Um, they exceeded their peers in lending to low and moderate income census tracts and low to moderate income individuals. They made um, significant qualified investments, $2.3 million in 2001, $9.6 million in in 2004, um, they expanded their, their, their branch network, uh, including in low and moderate income census tracts. 13% um, that you know, expanded it, it, their branch, their footprint in, in low and moderate income census tracts. So we looked at all of that. And still, it, it, we looked at all of that, and our examiners felt that their record, because of the all, you know, those are just some examples, and look, looked at their peers based on their asset size and determined that normally that institution would have been awarded an outstanding CRA rating. But because of the concern um, about the litigation, um, we downgraded the rating in 2001 to, um, out to, to satisfactory. So, so this our CRA reg, and we share the same reg on this point, is that uh, a finding of discrimination or other illegal credit practice um, has an adverse effect. It has an adverse impact. Um, it doesn't go as far as to it doesn't go as far to, to 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 put parameters around there. In other words, if you meet the overall spirit of CRA and all that I, you know, lending, investment, and services, the reg doesn't take you in the from the statute doesn't take you from here outstanding to all the way to substantial noncompliance. It does say it has an adverse effect, an adverse impact, and that's what happened in this instance. And and uh, Flagstar was appealed the decision, right? That's my understanding. Uh, but but even if Flagstar was appealing the decision, didn't didn't your examiners find the the discriminatory practices we're talking about during their CRA examination? Well, the 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 evaluation of fair lending would have been dealt with in our, in our fair lending exam as opposed to the CRA exam per se, we, we, where we bring all the tools and the models to bear in assessing fair lending. But, is but isn't it, but it, if I may, what, wasn't it true that OTS found it, it it's just a different division? Oh yes, oh yes, Absol okay. no, absolutely, so no, no, that's so right. So what I'm, what I'm wondering, if you could help this uh, subcommittee, mm -hmm. how can, how could your examiners overlook this discriminatory practice well, is it you know is was there a deficiency in the examination process itself? Was your CRA examiner underqualified? Could could you no, let this committee I know? Sure. Um, the reg calls upon us to look at the the extent of the evidence, the quality of the evidence, the corrective actions that were taking taken, the policies and procedures to prevent illegal discrimination. Those are all the, the factors that we consider when we determine, you know, the extent of a, of a downgrade. And so our examiners looked at all that. My, you know, I'm, I'm not an attorney, and I, and I especially, you know, don't want to say anything that's not quite right. Um, 
but my understanding of the litigation in Flagstar's case was that it was a, f a fairly, there were two cases. One was fairly small in terms of the, it was a class action, but it's a fairly small number of, of litigants. Most of those litigants were dismissed in the first um, area of litigation, which I believe was 1994. The second um, case, uh, again, resulted, resulted in um, a, um, resulted from a policy that Flagstar put in place to prevent charging minorities more than non-minorities. So they had a policy in place that, that said, my, again, my understanding, and I'm happy to, to kind of firm this up more if you like after the hearing, but well, well my, my understanding in looking at this was they said, you know, we want to make sure that we don't charge minorities more than non-minorities. So we have a policy where we're going to cap the overage, the amount that can go into towards broker compensation, basically the overall cost of the loan for um, for non-minorities at a, at a we're, they're going to potentially be, be paying more than minorities. So it was, it was a case of reverse discrimination. Um, and so the second case was about reverse discrimination where I think uh, there's a Caucasian a couple that alleged this problem. And so you know, in, s in some instances, you have an institution that, that maybe made a judgment to change their policy to make sure that they didn't um, discriminate against minorities and, and it resulted in this, in this policy. Well but my me but me to, to your broader point, that the we, lo we did look at the litigation, we looked at the scope of it, we, we, we examined their fair lending uh, policies, procedures, uh, their HMDA data, and based on all that, we determined that a, a downgrade was called for and it did take place well, you in you know, I, I, I want to ask something because we're, we're right on this case and, and this is somewhat mystifying and perhaps you could help uh, explain it to, to the subcommittee. Uh, instead of downgrading Flagstar, you gave it an outstanding rating. You actually gave them a higher grade after a court ruled on summary judgment that its written policy was discriminatory. The, the policy I just mentioned, yeah, the reverse yeah, right. discrimination. But I want to know, how could that happen? Could the you explain how that could happen, that, that, they, that they actually failed but they passed? I'll attempt to. We downgraded in the prior CRA exam. Your, the 2004 CRA exam did not reflect the uh, 2003 class action suit. I, again, I, a fairly limited scope of uh, affected borrowers. What we did look at was the, the corrective action the institution had took. We looked at their overall um, CRA performance their loan penetration and low and moderate income census tracts, their service activities, their investments, and based on all that, some of the data that I, I mentioned uh, earlier, um, we. So, so you're saying their written their, their written policy wasn't enough of a violation? Is that what you're saying? I'm saying that the examiners looked at the totality of Flagstar's CRA performance. And, uh, and determined in this instance there wasn't a second downgrade. It, you're right, it was an, an outstanding rating was given. I would say, Chairman Kucinich, that um, in, in our examination process, there is a level of judgment. And where well-intended, um, skilled and trained people may arrive at different conclusions. I, I wasn't um, I, privy to um, this case um, um, I, I and understand. The timing, I mean, but, but in, in retrospect, what does it look like to you? I mean, uh, you've got uh, someone who, uh, at a summary judgment, that his written policy mm -hmm. was discriminatory. Uh, instead of a downgrade, they got an uh, they got an upgrade, an outstanding. Right. Wha how does it? I mean, what does that say? I think it's a legitimate question that you've asked. Um, my read of the exam reports and uh, in talking with the examiners, the reason they arrived at the conclusion uh, to award an outstanding rating was based on the totality of how. And that they promised to take corrective action. Well, they, it, it was a, a rendering of their, for example, the expansion of their branch network, their, their, their overall lending activity, their service activity. 
the, the, the sense was that this institution, based on its ATSA size, um, had an outstanding CRA performance. Um, it, a matter of judgment, given the, the, the litigation, should there have been a second downgrade? You know, it's, I think it's a fair question. Um, well, do, do you think that uh, it's a fair observation to say that, uh, uh, that in this case the bank wasn't graded on its performance, instead it was graded on uh, what it promised to do? No, I don't. I think we look at their performance leading up to uh, that examination cycle. We looked at the data, not, not a promise, but we looked at the data. Um, that it didn't think in correction action, corrective action had taken place prior to that uh, exam report, uh, the second CRA exam rating. Didn't, didn't Flagstar expand its banking operations to an additional state as well as to an added metropolitan area in the states it was in during this time? And, and shouldn't Flagstar uh, lose its privilege to open new branches, acquire other holdings, or merge with other banks, given their record? Well, the CRA rule says that um, you know, a, a you know, non-compliance you know, needs to improve. A failing CRA rating is the trigger point for uh, impact with respect to applications. The, the assessment of Flagstar CRA performance did not rise to that level. Uh, it was downgraded once, it wasn't downgraded a second time, and, you're, and yes, they had taken corrective actions. Um, they had, for example, they eliminated the, that policy um, they made, uh, they reimbursed uh, in borrowers that had, that were impacted by that reverse discrimination policy. Um, and again, they looked at, our examiners looked at the institution's full record with respect to CRA and, and that's the determination that we came to. And I, you, you mentioned, you asked before about levels and yes, the, exam the examination comes in, there's a review at the regional office, there was a determination made that looking at the totality of their performance, that that, that was the appropriate rating. So uh, Flagstar gets an upgrade. Um, are you ever concerned that a case like this could send a signal to the rest of the industry that um, don't worry, practice discrimination, the worst, can ha worst thing can happen is you get caught, you get a slap on the hand, higher grade maybe. Does that, does that concern you? What concerns me is that we carry out our responsibility with respect to fair lending, with respect to CRA and compliance across the board um, in an effective way that looks at the totality of the circumstances. Um, in 37 cases, we have made downgrades to our institution CRA rating. You know, again, I, I, I take your point, though. I don't want to sound overly defensive. I think no, I, I, you know, we're trying. What we're trying to do is to look at the relationship between the role of the regulators, mm -hmm. the enforcement of the CRA or lack thereof, its implications for access to credit for mm -hmm. people in low and and and, uh, and moderate income areas. Right. The impact. Uh, of discriminatory lending, mm -hmm. the uh, growth of subprime loan products in those mm -hmm. same areas, mm -hmm. implications for predatory lending, the rise in bankruptcies and foreclosures. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is all, you know, a part of the whole, and we've got regulators here who, who I think could play a role in, in starting to um, give the public a little bit more protection. And That's so right. I, I'm, I'm looking, for example, Ms. Yakimov, between mm -hmm. 1999 right. and 2006, mm -hmm. uh, according, to, according to the information that the committee has, mm -hmm. you only referred two cases to the Department of Justice, mm -hmm. once in 2001 and once in 2004. Mm -hmm. Now, this could, on one hand, suggest that the banks that you regulate are fair lenders. Uh, which, it, you know, it's clearly not the case in light of the Flagstar case, or it could suggest you're enforcing sanctions left and right, or it might suggest that your thresh threshold for discrimination is very high and um, perhaps inconsistent with the Fair Housing Act and the Equal Credit Opportunity Act. Um, which one is it? 
Well, I and if I may, and I, I'm, sure. I'm happy to address that, but I, I did want to go back to well, well, you know what, go back, uh, first answer my question, then go back sure. to what you want to talk about. That's, that's fine. Thank um, you. You asked about uh, our, our record for re of referring, uh, referring uh, fair lending violations to the Department of Justice. Um, the director, John Rich, has been on board at OTS for a, a, a about two years and has made it a, a real commitment um, in bringing on a, a team, including myself, to take a robust look at the way we examine compliance. Uh, we've, made some s uh, we've made some changes to further strengthen our compliance examination program, including a recent n action to make sure that our compliance examiners are focusing on compliance, um, making sure that we do, we add more tools to look at um, fair lending, more models, more, m more, more data to manipulation. Um, I believe that those actions um, will result in even um, more robust fair lending assessments. And we have communicated that throughout our agency. Um, I would stand, I would say that the, our, our examination force is not reluctant to refer, but I do believe that um, OTS, I think for all agencies, the, the, is the process of continually looking at how to strengthen um, your training, your tools, and your focus uh, is important. And that's something that we've taken very seriously, including a, a robust look at top to bottom in compliance over the last 14 months. We've made a series of changes. So um, I take your point. The data kind of speaks for itself. I believe with some additional um, uh, actions that we've taken that there may be more activity in that area. What, what, I, what I would like you to do, I mean, y since you, you mentioned that you made some changes, and, and I would uh, ask that, that each of the regulators represented here uh, provide to the committee uh, what steps, specific steps, that uh, you have taken in light of what we've learned over the last uh, few years with the dynamics that, that we're discussing here. Dynamics being questions about CRA, level of CRA enforcement, the uh, uh, access to credit in low and moderate income areas, uh, foreclosure rates, um, you know, factoring in subprime lending, uh, to come up with a, a uh, both what you can do from this point on to further strengthen the enforcement of the Community Investment Act and, based on your experience with that act, to uh, inform this committee if there's any um, changes in the uh, CRA that the Congress could make that would make it easier for you to be able to perform your regulatory functions. Now, um, if, you if you could do that uh, uh, in our, uh, because the committee is going to continue to pursue this, this matter. And, 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 and we're not, I'm not interested in, in gotcha. I, I'm interested in trying to see what we can do as a matter of public policy to, um, uh, to go from this point on to provide some protection for American families who are who are trying desperately to get access to credit. I mean, because we, we still, you know, you know, even with all the foreclosures, we still the problem remains. It's intensified. So I just want to go um, to uh, Ms. Jedicky here, uh, and and this is going to be the last question that I'm going to pose to the members of the panel. I want to thank you for your patience here. Uh, it, 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 this is one of the most critical. Opportunities that we have to see if we can make any changes that would provide uh, some uh, additional protection to uh, American consumers who uh, who want to be homeowners. According to a 2003 National Training and Information Center study, um, which looked at the year 2001, 
15 of the top 25 lenders, or 60% of the top 25 lenders in the U.S., were not strictly regulated by the Community Reinvestment Act. Since Graham leached Bliley, which was 1999, depository institutions can acquire a number of financial institutions, including insurance companies, security firms, mortgage companies. These companies are exempt from the CRA because they're non-depository institutions. That means that a depository institution, which is subject to the CRA, can have affiliates that can evade CRA scrutiny. This demonstrates an incongruency between the CRA and Graham Leach Bliley. As a result, there's no law mandating that the majority of the most significant lenders have to meet the credit needs of their communities, and currently no regulatory agency has the authority to investigate their lending practices. So, uh, Ms. Jadicki, who regulates insurance companies, mortgage lending companies, security firms, and other non-depository financial institutions? There are a variety of different regulators for those entities, sir, depending on, on if it's a mortgage company, they may be regulated by HUD. Um, if they're subsidiaries of national banks, they're regulated by us. Now, that, that is... See, I, see, I just pointed out about uh, Graham Leach Bliley that there are non depository institutions that are exempt. And that are ex exempt from CRA, that are exempt. sir? Yeah, that, that are exempt. That, that, that a depository institution which is subject to CRA can have affiliates that, avo that evade CRA because of Graham Leach Bliley. You know, which includes insurance companies, securities firms, mortgage companies. These are, by definition, non-depository institutions. So I'm going to go back to the question. In light of the CRA, which is what we're talking about, uh, th these, these firms essentially, in terms of the CRA, aren't regulated, right? CRA applies to depository institutions. Right. That's correct. That's, I mean, that's, that's the right. point. So right. uh, unless somehow they're selected to be included in the exam by some, it which is un unlikely. Yes. Would, you, would you, everyone agree with that? Okay. So, so, so the affiliates' lending practices uh, if really don't get reviewed if their depository affiliates don't elect to include them in a CRA exam. Is that correct? Yes, sir. If the depository institution decides to include loans made by an affiliate because they're in their assessment area right. to get positive CRA credit, then we also attribute any illegal or discriminatory practices that we find. But, but if they're not going to include them, they're not going to be looked at, right? That's correct. Okay. So in the 2000, so, so isn't it possible that a CRA-regulated bank can move its financial assets to non-covered affiliates to reduce its CRA obligation? It's possible for them to move their assets into other affiliate organizations, yes. And it might affect the CRA questions and issues, but you have to understand there are other um, regulatory agencies yeah, who could enforce the fair lending issues or deal with the illegal discrimination issues. Isn't it possible for a CRA-regulated bank to build wealth in its community while its non-CRA-regulated affiliates can strip that same community through predatory lending or predatory practices? Is that possible? If if the if the affiliate loans are not if the affiliate loans are not included in the bank's CRA rating, in terms of getting credit for CRA, then the prac the illegal practices or discriminatory practices don't carry over. Into well, well, you know, this goes back to the challenge that I posed to all the members of the panel, and that is, uh, does the CRA adequately reflect today's financial markets? Um, and and what I'd like to hear from you in 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 writing, really is whether uh, you think the CRA should be revised to, um, to better reflect today's financial markets. It would be, be good to hear from you on that. Uh, I'm, um, uh, d d does anyone else on the panel want to uh, respond to, the, to that uh, question or the underlying spirit of the question? Anyone have anything to say on the record before we move on? 
Anyone? I want to. Um, I want to thank this panel. We've spent a lot of time. We've, we've uh, been here a few hours now, and more than that. And um, you, you are each individuals who who do have an in-depth knowledge of the institutions, which um, favors the work of this committee greatly. And I look forward to working together with you on this. I, I, I appreciate that you're really making an effort here. And uh, each one of us, uh, you know, represents some face of institutional power and responsibility. Uh, finds uh, ourselves at sometimes at a loss <laughs> to be able to account for the uh, deficiencies in the institutions we represent. And so I, I, I appreciate your willingness to work with this committee. And uh, I want to thank you for the time that you've spent. And we'll, we'll remain in communication on, on these issues. Uh, th this uh, panel is, is dismissed. We're going to call the next panel. And again, I want to thank you so much. It's just a very important panel. Thank you. We, um, we will be calling uh, the next panel to come forward. And uh, as, as the panel uh, comes forward, I, I want everyone to know that this is the Domestic Policy Subcommittee. We're continuing our uh, investigation of regulatory enforcement of the Community Reinvestment Act. And we've uh, had an excellent panel from various regulators uh, assist this committee in its ongoing probe. I want to I thank the the second panel here for its participation and for their uh, patience, because we've certainly have gone to uh, great lengths with the first panel. Thank the members of the second panel for their, their patience in, in waiting to uh, hear the testimony of the regulators. Uh, in, in the interest of time, what we're going to do is I'm going to make a brief introduction and um, of each member of the panel, uh, swear in the witnesses, and then go directly to their testimony. Uh, Mr. Calvin Bradford is a board member of the National Training and Information Center, founded in 1973 as a research and technical support provider to uh, National People's Action and other community organizations. This is a group that develops grassroots <coughs> leadership, spearheaded the Community Reinvestment Act, and uh, has, uh, their efforts have resulted in, in over a trillion dollars to uh, uh, low and moderate income families across the United States through their um, aggressive uh, advocacy on behalf of the public. And, and this, is, this is a group that's been involved in more community reinvestment agreements than any other organization in the country. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bradford. Mr. Carr. Uh, Mr. James Carr is the uh, Chief Operating Officer for National Community Reinvestment Coalition, advisory member of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, Center for Community Development Investments. Uh, he's um, been with the uh, Fannie Mae Foundation, uh, Director uh, for for tax policy, assistant director of the U.S. Senate Budget Committee, has uh, done work with various scholarly journals. We appreciate you being here, Mr. Carr. Uh, uh, Dr. Richard Marsico, is that pronounced? Yes, sir. I'm not a doctor. My mother was a diabetic. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know I, I had that same thing for a while. So. Uh, professor, is that okay? Okay, Professor Marsico? Marsico. Marsico? Uh, professor of Law, New York Law School, and Director of the Justice Action Center. Uh, professor Marsico's specialty is community reinvestment and fair lending. He's authored a book, Democratizing Capital, The History, Law, and Reform of Community Reinvestment Act. He's a graduate of Fordham and Harvard Law. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Van Toll. 
Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Director for Economic Justice for Rural Opportunities. It's a nonprofit, works on building assets, providing services for underserved individuals and communities in seven states in Puerto Rico. Uh, the uh, Rural Opportunities Incorporated, one of the largest nonprofit first time home buyer programs uh, in rural United States. Uh, Mr. Van Toll has been active on the National Community Reinvestment Coalition, was president of uh, Fairness in Rural Lending, and uh, which looks out of Wisconsin. Uh, I want to thank you, by the way, for uh, replacing Mr. Irvin Henderson, who couldn't join us because of circumstance beyond his control. He did, uh, Mr. Henderson did submit his testimony. We're going to include it for the record. But uh, I, I want to thank Mr. Van Toll for joining us on such a short notice from uh, coming in from New York. I would ask the uh, witnesses please stand and raise your hand. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Uh, thank you. Let the record reflect that the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. Uh, as with panel one, I'm going to ask each witness to give an oral summary of your testimony and keep the summary under five minutes in duration. Your complete written statement will be included in the hearing record. Mr. Bradford, let's begin with you. Thank you. If you could, uh, s if you could speak uh, right into the mic so we can hear you. Okay. Five minutes to address a couple of issues that um, didn't come up before that I, th I think need some attention. Um, First, I guess I'd like to respond to some of the Flagstar issues because I was an expert in both of the Flagstar cases that came up. And I'm kind of disappointed that at this point, after the OTS has been asked about this since 2002, that they still don't seem to understand the case. Um, the first case wasn't just a couple of, of, of uh, applicants. There was also a suit filed against them based on testing, a pattern and practice case that they settled out of court. And the reinvestment activities that the bank was given credit for that she mentioned to compensate them for their record were actually things they had to do because of the settlement in Detroit, opening branches and doing reinvestment that they wouldn't have done on their own. And second, uh, the written policy statement case, um, in the 30 years that I've been doing fair lending work, I've never seen a case where an institution managed to make a plaintiff out of every single person who applied for a loan. But that's actually what they did. It wasn't a small case. It involved the entire nation. It was a written policy for their entire mortgage operation. And what happened was white applicants had a case because they were charged too much for loans. It also turns out that the African-American applicants had a case because, because the brokers couldn't charge them as much for a loan. They didn't make as many black loans as they did before. And so they were discriminated against too. And, and for the OTS not to understand what a fundamental violation that is of the, of the Fair Housing Act and to, and to come here, I think, and try and defend that as something positive the bank was doing is so fundamentally wrong that it makes you concerned about whether they even understand what the Fair Housing Act is all about. Um, the second issue, I guess, I, I think we could spend a little a moment on is talking about the affiliate issues because we could cover that a, a little more. Um, for one thing, if, if you look in the CRA uh, process, a lender can choose to include the affiliates in the analysis, so they would be included. But then when you look at the fair lending record, the regulators look at the fair lending exam. The fair lending exam specifically excludes anything about the affiliates. In fact, they're prohibited from even talking to the affiliate as part of the exam process. So you've got another incongruity there about, about these things matching up. I know in my own testimony, I, I realized that just using Citicorp as an example and not claiming there's something wrong with their lending, you see some issues about the affiliates uh, that relate to the um, representative from the comptroller's comments. Um, just because the affiliate is included in the CRA exam doesn't mean that it got a fair lending review because of the way they look at it. For example, there's a, there's a Citigroup company called um, Citicorp Trust. Citicorp Trust makes thousands of only subprime loans across the United States. Its only community reinvestment area is Wilmington, Delaware, but it operates nationwide. So its CRA exam only covers Wilmington, Delaware. It works through Primerica, the largest financial services company in the country, which is part of Citigroup, and it only makes refinance 
loan consolidation, debt consolidation, refinance loans, and it has a special office, which is mentioned in the CRA exam by the OTS, whose sole purpose is to solicit existing customers, essentially flip the loans. Now, I'm not saying they did something wrong in these loans, but they give them an outstanding rating because they had more loans in low moderate income neighborhoods than any other lender. But that's precisely the concern we've had about subprime loans. There's too many of them in low moderate income neighborhoods. So in the CRI exam process, they make no effort to look at the nature of these loans and the way they were marketed and the substance of these loans. So even when the affiliate loans are included, um, they may be included in this process in a way that's really detrimental to the community. And the other issue I discovered was that even though this, this company makes thousands of loans, one of the largest subprime lenders Citigroup has around the country, when other Citigroup um, subsidiaries, savings and loans and banks, elected to include all their affiliates, neither the OCC or the OTS ever included the loans of CityTrust, this big major subprime lender. Seems to me a clear violation of the, of the rule that you're supposed to include them. In Chicago, that, the, in the, for Chicago's um, Citicorp Savings Bank, that actually meant that in their CRA areas, in one year, 85% of the subprime loans were not included. And for the next year, it would have increased the level of subprime loans by over 600% had they included this affiliate. So they're just plain not included. And it seems to me um, we should be um, concerned about that. So um, I would have those issues. The other uh, issue I'll mention just before I stop is that if you look at the CRA exams in the fair lending part, it says that you're supposed to look at the fair lending exam. If you look at the fair lending exam, it tells you to go look at the CRA exam. The CRA exam you're supposed to look at because it's going to tell you if there's racial discrimination. But under the CRA, there's no analysis done by race. So it couldn't possibly tell you about race discrimination. And these have been on the books now for over a decade. And you would think that agencies that seriously were concerned about fair lending would have eliminated this obvious and clear incongruity in these, in these kinds of things. So I'll, I'll just end there because I know you have the whole written statement. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bradford. Mr. Carr. Good afternoon, Chairman. Good afternoon, Chairman Kucinich. On behalf of the National Community Reinvestment Coalition and our 600 community nonprofit members across the country, we are honored to have the opportunity to speak to you today about this important act. Since its enactment in the late 1970s, the Community Reinvestment Act has uh, leveraged more than four $0.5 trillion of loans and investments to uh, families and individuals in communities that have been most challenged in accessing credit. And lots of organizations, including Harvard University and key federal agencies, including the Treasury Department and the Federal Reserve, have concluded that those loans were done in a safe and sound manner. Those investments have helped to build homes, launch or expand small businesses, build important community facilities, and grow the wealth of otherwise financially vulnerable families. Yet despite all of its success, the goals of CRA have yet to be fulfilled. Between 9 to 22 million households do not have a relationship with a major bank or savings institution. At the same time, millions more only have tenuous ties. And over the past decade and a half, high-cost lending has grown exponentially, disproportionately in moderate income and minority communities. Uh, since 1993, for example, payday lending has grown from a modest 300 establishments to more than 25,000 today, and we all know the story of subprime lending and particularly predatory lending and the disproportionate impact it has on minority and low and moderate income communities. In my written testimony, I highlight six recommendations that if enacted could greatly enhance the effectiveness of CRA to increase credit and capital and other banking services to disadvantaged communities. And they include such things as mandatory inclusion of non-depository affiliates in CRA exams, as well as the inclusion of institutions such as credit unions and mortgage companies under CRA. Um, we recommend a series of provisions related to fair lending examinations specifically, uh, as well as a number of uh, recommendations related to the assessment areas and how those procedures are developed. In conclusion, let me just say that consumers who function outside of the financial mainstream often operate in a cash or informal economy. A large and growing informal economy is not in the best interest of America. Financially stifling homeowners with unfair, unreasonable, or otherwise deceptive and costly mortgage products is not in the interest of America. 
families with negative savings rates are not in the interest of America. And communities unable to tap the credit markets for responsible and critical community facilities is not in the interest of America. In 1960, Mr. Chairman, we put a man on the moon. It's hard to believe that 40 years later, we can't put a consumer in a bank. In many respects, it's not a lack of will, rather it's a lack of want, and that is a want to achieve on this important goal. It's not a dearth of financial expertise, rather it's a lack of appreciation for the value of achieving that goal. Achieving the goals of CRA are in the best long-term future interest of America, of our economy, of our society. But those interests cannot be measured by quarterly earnings, the principal gauge by which business is used to determine opportunity. As a result, in addition to repairing the fabric of CRA so that it can achieve its important mission, we also turn to you and encourage you and ask that you work with us to help inspire the business community to do what currently it is not doing and that is inspiring them to reach out and affirmatively want to help to improve markets that don't function effectively in this country. At the end of the day, we know that when America is inspired, it will achieve. We put a person on the moon because we decided we needed to do that, and we were committed to it, and we did it. There is nothing stopping us from succeeding in our goals on CRA, except the will and the want and the understanding that it's in the national interest. And with that, I'll conclude and uh, I'm prepared to answer any questions you might ask. I thank the gentleman, uh, Professor Marsica. Thank you. <coughs> as, I was listening, as I was listening to the testimony, I found myself writing and rewriting my own oral testimony until finally I've thrown it out and I have really two points that I would like to make. Um, and the first point is that the one of the problems with the performance, CRA performance evaluations not reflecting bank performance is that the agencies have too much discretion in evaluating banks and generally tend to exercise it in a way that overstates or overrates bank performance. Um, no two CRA performance evaluations look alike. Um, the uh, agencies have discretion about the criteria they will use to evaluate bank lending the benchmarks they will use to uh, measure the, whether the banks have satisfied the criteria and how to evaluate whether the banks have satisfied the criteria or not. So for example, a performance evaluation might state it's going to look at the percentage of loans that the bank made to low and moderate income neighborhoods. It will uh, compare that, for example, to the percent of uh, such loans by all lenders in the community, and then it will sort of say the bank is close, the bank didn't quite make it, the bank didn't quite reach, or maybe the bank did do a little better than the benchmark, but there's no uh, sort of definitive statement of whether the bank has satisfied the criteria or not. And um, as a result, the agencies tend to uh, ignore uh, bank performance that does not meet the criteria that the, uh, that the performance evaluations have established. So they have, a, uh, they have this discretion um, to decide not only what criteria to look at and what the benchmarks will be, but then when the bank doesn't meet the benchmark, they have the discretion to say, well, that's okay, we're not going to hold that against the bank, and it, it will get passing grades on the performance evaluations anyway. So one uh, thing I would urge the, com the subcommittee to consider is whether there should be a standard set of criteria against what uh, to use to look at bank lending, a standard set of benchmarks, and then uh, requiring the agencies to make definitive conclusions about what happens when the bank uh, does not meet those benchmarks. The second point I'd like to make is that there's been a lot of discussion about the fact that the agencies may not be taking into account in the CRA evaluations the uh, results of the fair housing and equal credit evaluations that go on separately from the CRA evaluation. And I want to make a, a, a another related point, which is the agencies do not uh, evaluate lending by race in their own CRA evaluations. They, event, they, they evaluate lending by income, but they do not evaluate lending by race. The justification for this being that the community reinvestment statute says 
the, the banks have an obligation to meet the credit needs of their entire communities, including low and moderate income neighborhoods. The agencies have apparently seized on that to say, therefore, we don't look at race when we do these reports. I tend to disagree with that. I've, I believe there's uh, sufficient uh, legislative history that would support uh, showing that Congress was also worried about racial redlining, not just in income redlining, and therefore the agencies should take race into account when doing their CRA evaluations. And the, the failure to take race into account has some very significant uh, 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 um, consequences. For example, you won't see in a, in a CRA performance evaluation report generally um, any statistics about that would compare a bank's subprime lending on the basis of race. Uh, you won't find um, what, what, what we might call disparity ratios in there that, sh that compare the percentage of uh, African Americans who receive subprime loans with the percentage of whites who receive subprime loans because they don't look at race. So the evaluation report can show a lot of lending in low and moderate income neighborhoods but might not show that that lending might be uh, because they're making a lot of subprime loans and that those subprime loans uh, may be uh, disparately distributed based on race. So my two points would be simply um, create some more uh, uh, accountability <laughs> in the CRA exams by establishing set criteria and benchmarks and what will happen if the banks don't reach the benchmarks and require the agencies to consider lending by race when they do their performance evaluations. Thank you very much. Uh, before we go to Mr. Van Tol, I, I would just like the uh, committee to take note of uh, something that uh, Professor Marsico just said. I, I think it would be helpful if we put some statistics side by side, the, um, uh, the, n the number of, of uh, subprime loans, the, um, the lack of uh, the number of loans generated, the number of loans generated in an area, the percentage of those loans that went to minorities, the prime loans, the number of subprime loans that were generated, the percentage that went to minorities. Now, we've done half the equation, I think, already for this committee, but I think it would be helpful if we put them side by side because that would then, you know, get to, get to your question. And then, of course, you look at the CRA, number of CRA reviews and the, um, uh, the number of favorable reviews, the number of unfavorable reviews, and and then we we know where it goes from there. So I I, you know, I just wanted to just stop the music for a second. Let's go back to uh, Mr. Van Toll. You recognize? Please proceed. Good afternoon, Chairman Kucinich and Congressman Cummings. My name is Hubert Van Toll, and I am the director for Economic Justice for Rural Opportunities Inc. in Rochester, New York. Thanks for the opportunity. Our our organization is a member of the National Community Reinvestment Coalition and we support the comments and written statement of Jim Carr on NCRC's behalf. Today I want to speak, however, as a longtime grassroots CRA activist who has found and still finds the CRA law as an enormously powerful tool for individuals and organizations that do grassroots community development work. In my limited time today, I'll just touch on the way that discrimination in lending has become more subtle and more damaging and the failure of the regulators with their use of the fair lending exam and the CRA exam to keep up with the changes in lending. I first became aware of the Community Reinvestment Act in 1985 while working for a local community development corporation in Memphis, Tennessee. At that time, discrimination and access to credit was raw and blatant. For instance, we found lenders whose mortgage underwriting guidelines explicitly stated that they would not lend in areas of incipient decline. Their guidelines specified minimum loan amounts that excluded most of the houses in the African American neighborhoods in Memphis. Some of the would lenders you, Would you state that again? Uh, their guidelines specified minimum loan amounts that would exclude by their size. They were $35,000 and $50,000 minimums. And in effect, the houses in the African American neighborhoods were selling for less than that at that time. So they would not lend to those areas because they didn't meet their minimum loan guidelines. There was bad 
home mortgage disclosure data, for instance. In the case of one company, they showed the loan loans in in inner city Memphis <coughs> average in a million dollars a piece. This is eight years after the passage <coughs> of the CRA and 10 years after the passage of the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act and the regulators on their own had not come to the conclusion that there were any problems with that. So it took community organizations like us really pounding on them and using the bully pulpit and tool of public relations for a year before the regulators began asking questions. And I think you're seeing an aspect of the same phenomenon now. Uh, it depends on leadership at the top and how, uh, how their attitude towards the regulation of consumer regulation, or towards consumer regulation um, um, happens. In 86, our organization attempted dialogue with the banks, but uh, it, we didn't really have dialogue until the regulators got in there and, and failed. Well, they didn't fail them on their CRA exam, but in two cases, we had them deny mergers and a new bank, uh, bank branch application, and that created the impetus for real change to happen. But today, the discrimination, for the most part, doesn't involve access to credit, which was the issue then, but rather the fact that minority neighborhoods are really targeted with inferior loan products, high fees, high interest rates, unfavorable terms. They're targeted regardless of the credit scores of the individual borrowers within those neighborhoods. And when a group of people are targeted for bad financial products, it creates a cascading f effect, a self-fulfilling prophecy, if you will, as they are sold risky loan products, which over time put stress on their financial situations and have the practical effect of driving down their individual credit scores and making them, quote, riskier borrowers. The banks have really facilitated this shift by doing a poor job of marketing in those neighborhoods, removing their branches from neighborhoods, they provide the lines of credit used by the brokers and the mortgage lenders. Some of them service those subprime loans. The, the investment bank side of the bank often is securitizing those loans, even while they're proudly saying that the retail division doesn't do subprime lending. So when a bank's fair lending examination is done, there's no public indication that this entire range of bank involvement in a subprime market that targeted at minority borrows is, is looked at. And in spite of the efforts of community activists, it's rare that a bank service and investment test in the CRA exam itself looks at all of these issues in a comprehensive way. The single, this has been the single most egregious area of discrimination in lending over the past decade, this targeting of inferior loan products to minority neighborhoods. And it's really been the marketing that's been a, a tremendous problem. Um, in, the la in the two and a half years that I have been working for Rural Opportunities, which as you said, uh, does work in seven states in Puerto Rico and is one of the largest rural operators of a first time home buyer program, there have been no visits to me by a CRA examiner or to my organization to ask us what our opinion is of the banks that they're about to do CRA exams on. And I think it just reflects uh, the fact that they have become much more lackadaisical about this. Uh, they're, uh, because there are, uh, there is this attitude that works its way through the bureaucracy and the banks quickly lower their standards to the minimum needed to get a passing grade. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, just to put this in context, you know, I, I happen to be the chair of the Domestic Policy Subcommittee. It's uh, a committee that has a pretty broad reach in, in every area in, in the government with the exception of of uh, affairs governing the military and the uh, and, and most of the State Department. Years ago, 30 years ago, I, I was mayor of the city. I was elected mayor of the city of Cleveland. Uh, I could see the kind of effects beginning to percolate back then of people not having access to credit, which is why when at the first opportunity the city of Cleveland 
uh, under my administration, pursued uh, an action under the CRA uh, against a, uh, an institution uh, in a neighborhood uh, known as the Kinsman neighborhood in Cleveland, Mount, Kinsman Mount Pleasant. And, and we saw community groups participating because they were, they were the first ones that had the information about what the lack of access to credit was doing. And it wasn't just for credit for the purposes of home ownership. It was credit for small businesses because, you know, people are trying to engage in some commerce in the community. So I, I just want you to know that the that what you brought here just in as a individuals is highly respected in terms of the commitment that you make with your life to looking at these issues which are so uh, devastating on a personal level Be because you know we, we sometimes get lost in the minutia in broad uh, quantitative assessments that can be very devastating but when you take it down to an individual level somebody um, has great hopes they're finally going to get a chance to own a home mm -hmm. and uh, somebody markets a predatory uh, a loan that you know turns out to be predatory okay no documents wow we're gonna have our home and we know what happens from there I mean this thing is so broad it, it's it's caused uh, a shakeout in Wall Street mm -hmm. not a small matter you know, from Main Street to Wall Street, we see what, what happens. And Mr. Bradford, uh, deliberate subversion of the CRA, uh, deliberate effort to circumvent uh, federal uh, fair lending laws. Uh, what do you think? Well, I don't, I'm not so sure. I don't know if it's deliberate, but it's, it's it's more inconceivable, I guess, from my point of view. I mean, these agencies have have got the regulations and the examination procedures that say you should look for redlining. They tell you how to do it. They say to look outside the assessment area to see if they included them, and then they don't do that. I think another example, um, again, from the OTS, that's that's of concern. I think people have been suggesting that if there's any kind of concern about discrimination, it shows up in the public um, evaluations, and that's not true. The agencies are very protective of the internal examinations they give them. And I know in a couple of cases I've been involved in where, where attorneys have asked the agencies for copies of those they've not only give, not given to them, but threatened to go to court if they tried to use them. So but the agencies protect the lender? They do, but in the Flagstar case, the internal exam was submitted as part of the trial record, so I can talk about that. <laughs> it please, wasn't my responsibility. Sure. And at that examination, um, the OTS not only the OTS identified an appraisal practice that Flagstar had that had a minimum appraisal amount, and they wouldn't make any loan um, to anybody below the appraisal amount, which is pretty much like what Hubert was saying before. And it's a classic kind of discriminatory effect policy. Where, w and not only that, the OTS had done a systematic analysis of the Humda data and the census data to show the bank that this had a disparate impact on minority neighborhoods. And yet, when it came to the public, evaluation, they had that standard little clause that they could find no violations of the Fair Housing Act. Well, that just wasn't correct because they had in great detail shown these to the bank and required the bank to do something about it. So there's always that, and I've seen it in other cases that I can't talk about because they weren't part of a trial record, but I've, I've seen it over and over again that there are issues like that that come up the public doesn't know about. And so, you know, that gives me concerns. I think, as I said in my, my testimony, they sort of treat the regulations like a kind of regulatory signing statement that, you know, we don't care what Justice Department thinks fair lending is. We get to reinterpret it ourselves a a a in the case of, of Old Kent that you were going through. For them to say, well, it's a reasonable area because now, after 1995, when we changed the definition of delineation of service area, we said you could keep defining these little areas where you made your loans around all your offices and that would be okay. And so in the case of Old Kent, you just kept opening offices in the suburbs and making your little circles around them. And when you put them all together, you ringed the city of Detroit, but you didn't serve the city of Detroit. And they said, well, that's an okay business practice for the bank. But, but in their fair lending examination, they say that that would be a disparate impact. And the only defense for a disparate impact is a business necessity, a compelling business necessity. The OCC says it, it can't be hypothetical. It's gotta be real. It's gotta be impending. 
The South Shore Bank's only assessment area is called Shore Bank now in the city of Detroit, where they have a bank, is the city of Detroit. They make lots of money. They get outstanding ratings. So evidently, you can do business in Detroit in a profitable way. So what would the business necessity defense be for Old Kent or anyone else, or, or Mid-America Bank in Chicago, or, or First, Net First Bank uh, in Chicago, both of whom had these amoeba-shaped areas in the suburbs? I, it's inconceivable to me that the regulatory people don't understand their own regulations and don't understand the fair lending laws, so I guess they feel they're above the civil rights laws. So, uh, because in your written statement, you said that the CRA intended to prohibit discriminatory practices based on race as well as income, uh, but, you know, only today only expressly prohibits discrimination uh, based on, on income. And that's right, that but that, that, that's because at the time when Proxmire was, was proposing it and, and we were working on the language, the ECOA had just been passed the year before and the Fair Housing Act had, had been in effect for a while and, and there had already been all these redlining studies. Humda was just passed the year before that. You know, we were told by the congressional aides and by the, by the people drafting the legislation that it would be um, just redundant to put that in the act. Everybody understood that that was there. But there's no federal protection by income. So they said we better put that in the legislation because even though race is clearly already covered, income wasn't. So that's, that's why that survived so in the act. So uh, how would the CRA be enhanced if regulatory agencies automatically failed banks that have discriminatory and, and other illegal practices? Well, I'll give you an example of it. I, if you looked at Flagstar Bank during the period where these violations were taking place, they went from an institution of $500 million to an institution of $13 billion. That is, they increased their size by 26-fold because they had the privilege of acquiring and branching and merging with people during this time. And if they'd failed the CRA, they probably wouldn't have had that privilege. So that's a pretty serious issue to for a lending institution. See, I, I mean, that's, that's actually, you know, it's a same question, sense of the question I asked the representative of the Fed, because if you if you get failed at that first level, right. when your uh, worth is five hundred million, you don't get to thirteen billion. Well, that would be what we all believed would be the case. Well, well I, but passed. the point is uh, that is if there's an active regulation, right. and and uh, and and people are failed <coughs> or something else happens, and that is that the, um, the volume of, of access increases for people in uh, underserved population, low and, and moderate income areas, as well as by virtue of, of definition of people of color. Right, but the intention of the act at that time, which I think still holds true, was to increase the access to prime lending and to targ targeted prime lending not to just increase the access to FHA loans or subprime loans. No, I, I understand that. Good point. I know you uh, Absolutely. <laughs> no, I, I'm right. glad you pointed that out. Right. But since today, right. uh, people of color uh, end up more often than not being in that low, middle income, low and moderate income right. area, uh, they have a disproportionate, um, a, a, dis a disproportionate burden if the CRA is not enforced. Um, and, and so, um, Mr. Carr, I uh, wanted to uh, talk about your testimony. You, you discuss how banks make a significant amount of loans outside of their assessment areas and therefore go undetected by federal regulatory agencies. Uh, how can that be legally possible? Could you explain that? Yes, in fact, the, um, because of the procedures that define assessment areas, uh, generally require that a bank uh, report within the areas in which is defined as its assessment areas in which it has uh, CRA covered institutions that have locations, uh, generally the location around uh, their bank branches. Um, and so to the extent that uh, institutions are allowed to, uh, they have affiliates that are not covered. Uh, in one particular study uh, which we examined for um, major banks, we found that as little as 11 to 13 percent of the total lending uh, actually was covered, was uh, concluded to be covered because the institutions were not inclu uh, included in the review. The mortgage lending institutions were not included in the review. 
And what that does is greatly undermine uh, any effectiveness of CRA, uh, of CRA enforcement for that lending activity. Mr. Kyer, uh, presently, uh, bank regulatory agencies are only describing banking lending activities in one to three sentences. How can community groups benefit from a more detailed description of the fair lending review in the CRA exam? Well, that is one of the more odd and unusual circumstances and a major change from the 1990s in which, in fact, the uh, federal agencies used to provide detailed information about the types of statistical tests that were uh, employed, uh, it, was it matched pair testing, et cetera, what types of statistical models were used, and on. Uh, today, the reviews are often in a sentence that just simply says that a bank has uh, passed its uh, fair lending test. And what that does is it disallows uh, community organizations and civil rights attorneys and others who might have an interest in the act to actually explore what exactly was done to comment as to whether there were things that were clear omissions or where improvements in those examinations could take place. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Marsico. Uh, in your written testimony, you mentioned that community groups and banks can enter, enter into CRA agreements which are designed to redress weaknesses in the bank's CRA lending records. In your opinion, do corrective actions agreed on by the banks and their federal regulators achieve the same goals? I don't, I would, I would say I, I'm not, sh I have not seen any of those <laughs> corrective agreements. I don't believe that they're made public. And I, I think one of the people today uh, referred to those agreements and, uh, a and I don't think that mentioned that, it, that they are made public, uh, which is a, which if true is a problem because one of the reasons that the agreements between lenders and banks and community groups work is that they are publicly made and they are agreed upon and they uh, have monitoring reports that are issued publicly and periodic meetings with the community groups to show what they're doing. So, so, so you're saying the very lack of transparency on agreements between banks and federal regulators can uh, constitute a subversion of the principles of the Community Reinvestment Act? Yes, I, I believe it should all be transparent. I, I, I don't see why the results of the fair lending exams are not made public. Uh, the, CRA, the, the CRA performance evaluations are made public. I, frankly, it, it's very odd when you get to the fair lending portion when it says the results of the exam were showed no violations, yet they don't show you the results when they've just gone through a hundred pages of information about the CRA record of the bank. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to hold, uh, I want to come back to you, but I, I want to introduce uh, a member of our panel who has been uh, an outstanding uh, representative on so many economic issues affecting urban America. Uh, Mr. Cummings and I have worked on a, on a broad range of uh, social and economic concerns relating to access to credit, health care, infrastructure. I want to introduce the distinguished uh, gentleman from uh, Baltimore, Maryland, uh, Elijah Cummings. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I only have a few questions. I, you know, as I was sitting here, gentlemen, I was just thinking, um, you know, when you are an African American um, in the position that I'm in, and you talk about race, or even if you're white, talk about race, and you say you can you say that people are being discriminated against and suffering. You know what you, you people usually say? They usually say, "Here they go again." Here they go again. It's all their fault. And uh, when you come with the kind of evidence that you presented here today, I mean, this is, I mean, you, you, you're actually laying it out there. This is it. And I was thinking to myself, a few years back, we had a, um, uh, uh, a woman uh, who is now a bishop in the AME Church, Bishop Vashon McKenzie in Baltimore. Uh, one of the things that she did is she began to look at what the banks were doing. And she, I think, saw 
that, for example, maybe African Americans were not getting the loans that they um, were rightfully due and started looking at a number of issues. And so what she did was bring the churches together and they said, basically, if you want to do business with us, and they had about, I'm, I guess, I can't remember how many churches, probably 15 or 20 churches, thousands of people. Uh, you, you've got to come right. Now, this is where I'm going with this. I'm trying to figure out how does the, first of all, most people who are being victimized don't even know they're being victimized. And I'm trying to figure out a two-track uh, solution. One track is how do people come together and do things similar to what, say, uh, the church did, that is to try to uh, come up with a remedy where they force these banks to pay attention. Because I can tell you, I live in the inner, 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 inner city of Baltimore, and there are no banks. I mean, to get to a bank, I have to go at least a mile, at least about, about two miles to get to a bank. And that's not unusual. Um, and I'm trying to figure out, you know, I, 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 I really want to believe in government, and I do to a degree. But government takes so long to get stuff done. And I'm trying to figure out if I'm talking to my community people and they want to organize and figure out ways to make uh, the whole purpose of CRA do what it's supposed to do, what do they do? And then on the other hand, what do we do in trying to tighten it up on this end? Anybody? <laughs> you all understand the question? Yes. <laughs> all right. I'll, I'll sort of give a couple stabs at it. One of the things that's discouraging is the regulators in 1995, they took out some of the assessment factors that included the community. They essentially cut the community out of the CRA process because they eliminated um, looking at how the lender assessed, ag assessed credit needs. And so they made this a kind of private deal between the regulators and the banks. And then in 1999, as part of um, Graham Leach Bliley, you got the Sunshine, what they call Sunshine, which we refer to as Sunstroke <laughs> provision which was really designed to intimidate community groups, to say, if you participate in making any comments and then you make an agreement with the bank, we're going to hold all these sanctions against you, but we're not going to make the bank do anything or enforce anything. We don't even recognize the agreement as being e existing, but, but we could take the money away from you and prohibit you from doing CRA stuff for 10 years. And I don't even know if that fits the Equal Protection Clause <laughs> in the Constitution, but, but that provision of, of, of Graham Leach um, Bliley, and then, and then the Federal Reserve expanded that in their regulations. And they said a definition of an agreement is if you go and talk to a bank and say we want these four types of loans. And then later on, without ever talking to you again, the bank has a press conference. And this is an example they actually use in the regulations. And, and, and they identify those four types of loans, even though they're not going to do them the way you want it. The regulators and the banks can declare that an agreement, and they can impose all these sanctions against you, even though you not only didn't sign it, but you probably don't even like it. I mean, I mean, this is sort of congressionally mandated harassment of the community people who are supposed to be involved. And it has scared a lot of people off. And I mean, there are a lot of brave people on this panel and, <laughs> and in Cleveland and in Massachusetts who stood up against it. But, but it's a threatening tactic. And I, it's embarrassing to have my government do that to the very people who have created the agreements. And these agreements have been the basis of the most creative forms of reinvestment in our country. There, that's where, outside of say something like South Shore Bank, that's where all the best programs came from, the most creative programs like, well, in Baltimore, you got, you got to have mixed use stuff because you got businesses and residential together. Banks didn't want to do that, so you had to create special programs and neighborhoods did that. They wanted to have stuff for side-by-sides and, and duplexes because a lot of housing was that way and banks only wanted to do single family and so they had to create those programs <coughs> themselves. And I don't have to tell you about it because Baltimore's got one of the strongest histories of this kind of development activity that we've ever had. The first, the first study that led to the Humda Act was actually a study in 73 in Baltimore. So, you know, I, I understand, you know, what you're coming to. I think we got to the point where you have to amend the Community Reinvestment Act to tell the regulators some of the things that they have to do because their discretion is never going to work. I think as, as Chairman found out before, they can't pull the trigger. 
no matter what you do to violate the fair lending laws, they just can't bring themselves to pull the trigger and give you a failing grade. So the law's got to be changed to say you, you, know, you, you, you have to include the assessment of whether there's a disparate in minority impact. You have to decide if people violate the law or do that, that they, that they fail. You have to include all the affiliates and what they're doing in your assessment. If any affiliate discriminates, then the entire bank fails at CRA, even if that affiliate's in California. We don't care where they are. You violate federal laws in this country, you lose your banking privileges, period. You gotta, gotta lay it all out to them because they just don't get it. And then that will give the community people the chance to do these things because I've been in it for f almost 40 years. And I gotta tell you- uh, How long, how long? About almost 40 years before there was a CRA mm -hmm. working with these things. And nobody has figured out how to serve community needs like the community. And I've evaluated these reinvestment agreements, and I, I know other people on the panel have looked at these too. And this is the most kind of creative stuff. We intended when we passed the CRA to create a development banking industry. And it was only gonna happen if the community people came into it, because the banks had no idea how to do it. We got the World Bank and everything else to help other countries. We had nothing for the United States. And we had South Shore Bank. We had some pretty impressive agreements early on. But if the regulatory agencies just sort of abandon this thing, we're losing the strength and it's all come from the community people. Let, let me just ask you this. What part does the Federal Reserve play in all of this, if any? I mean. Well, they're the key. They write the regulations. And they can, everybody. and they, they have a lot of say. Sure. Let, let me tell you why I'm asking you this. When we, uh, I also serve on the Joint Economic Committee. Mm -hmm. And when we were dealing with subprime, we're still dealing with the subprime market and mm -hmm. the abuse. Uh, we wrote to Bernanke and asked him to lay out some um, guidelines with regard to avoiding making trying. Try, we were trying to make sure that people were protected as best the reserve could do uh, with regard to these subprimes. And I'm just wondering, you know, I'm trying to think of all the different kinds of methods that we can go at this thing. Because you know what I'm afraid of it, is that uh, I can almost fast forward in 20 years. This a whole different set of people will be here. We'll be some of us will be in rocking chairs, <laughs> and it'll be people who have who have been denied what the the law said they should have gotten, and then it'll all also have hit another generation, and we'll be going through the same stuff and I'm just trying to figure out how do we I hear you but how do we put brakes on this and actually mm -hmm. you know because this gets kind of complicated you know and so people 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 they, they lose their attention with regard to this kind of thing because most a lot of people don't have a clue of what CRA is mm -hmm. so but you know just and then I'll turn it back over to you mr. chairman I'm just trying to figure out how do we move from square one Probably so that we can actually have some impact. I'm sorry, I, I just want to finish this. So that we actually have some impact because, I mean, we can wrestle and wrestle and wrestle, and the only thing we've done is, you know, messed up the wrestling mat a little bit, and that's it. And, and, and the beat goes on. And I think people depend on the beat going on. They depend on people not paying attention while they get while while folk are getting rich and my last question is you know when I was a little boy I remember specifically we would go downtown to in Baltimore there was one store in all two stores in all of downtown Baltimore that would sell clothes to black folks and I was just a little kid about five years old and I'll never forget standing in the long lines. And I asked my mom, I said, Mom, I don't understand this. All those stores out there, and there's like 300 black people standing in line getting school clothes from the one school. I said, what, don't those other stores want to make some money? You know, I was just a little kid. And for the, I mean, and I'm trying to figure out, do you all see this as, as just blatant discrimination? Do you think people just have a negative view of, of, of uh, minorities? Do you think that they is some kind of grand scheme to keep 
certain neighborhoods in a certain state. I mean, you know, going back to my example, there are people who, who have great credit. They so happen to be African American. They're, they're whites. They're all kinds. But do you kind of just blanket out a whole group of people and say, okay, later for you? I mean, is it are we that mean in this society? And do you think you must have an opinion? <laughs> uh, Congressman, I was going to say, if you look at uh, most distressed neighborhoods, you probably see a combination of things happening. Uh, one is financial vulnerability that predisposes people to being taken advantage of. And then compounding that is active discrimination in the markets. And one of the things that's just interesting is to see how regulation is often upside down, where the people who are most financially vulnerable receive the least protection from financial services industry, from the uh, regulatory agencies. And so, for example, if you look at the subprime lenders, the predatory lenders, in fact, they were the least regulated entities. And so why does that happen? It shouldn't happen. And the reality of it is that for all the weaknesses of CRA, there were a lot of things that could have been done directly to better regulate the subprime market, and it wasn't. And so that is probably the greatest source of damage to African-American wealth, um, at least for this half century, maybe for that, the uh, entire century. The African-American home ownership rate is falling fast. So to get to your question about what do you do, I think, first of all, um, independent of CRA, we need to put into laws effective regulations for those entities that are nevertheless serving those communities. Um, you know, payday lenders, rent to own, title lenders, subprime lenders need better national regulation specifically. Um, in our testimony, we say to some extent uh, we bring those institutions under CRA umbrella, but that will only be good to the extent that CRA is actually enforced which leads me to a comment that I made at the opening of my statement, which sometimes is considered or thought to be a throwaway line, but I don't mean it to be so at all. I don't think that there is a good appreciation for the value of consumers who live in places like Baltimore and Philadelphia mm -hmm. and Cleveland and other distressed communities across this country. I don't know that there is a real understanding about the money that flows through those neighborhoods and how in uh, dysfunctional ways it doesn't, in fact, accrue to the national economic GDP the way that it could. And as minority households grow as a share of the U.S. population, one thing that would be interesting, I think, for the Federal Reserve to do is take a look at the growing participation of minorities in the labor market and sort of ask, you know, sort of scenarios. How much better could the country be off if we were, in fact, empowering them economically? Mm -hmm. And then maybe Congress might have to do some exceptional things like to empower and or create financial institutions that aim at those markets that have hit been historically discriminated against, for which there is enormous market failure, and really experiment. Do some financial engineering and bring those consumers into the 21st century of financial services access. The, I, I'll just conclude by saying my real belief in talking about these issues, just like the last panel, you can't understand the rationale. It's inconceivable. And I wouldn't have an answer as to why we don't just simply enforce the laws as effectively as we can. So I would conclude that the value of doing it does not out outweigh all of the political challenges that are perceived to be faced by those who must enforce it. I don't know. That's my own personal comments, not those of NCRC, but I share your frustration. Just one last thing. You know, as you were talking, I couldn't help but think about we, um, you know, we used to, we just started getting these targets. And um, it's interesting that when you go to the Target stores, they're packed with black people. I mean, before, Target wouldn't even come to some of these neighborhoods. But now, they're packed. <laughs> you know, usually Target's mm -hmm. claim to fame is that you don't have lines. Did you know that, Mr. Chairman? <laughs> in other words, their claim to fame is they want to appeal to people and they have enough checkout counters. That's part of their scheme so that you feel comfortable coming in so you can get in and get out. I mean, they have all kinds of checkers in, in the black community and they still got lines. What my point is is that something, somebody woke up to what you just said and said, wait a minute, hold it. Oh, there are black people. They do need trash cans. They do need, you know, diapers. They do need, and so let's go there. 
Well, it took them years to even get there, which is, uh, to me, incredible. Mr. Chairman, I, I know I've gone longer than you, and uh, you've been I, very I, kind. I would just, on the target issue, it's kind of, it's interesting, because I used to work in Minneapolis, which is where they're located, so they're from. And in Minneapolis, nobody would build a store in the inner city, and the neighborhood people demanded they build a store, and they finally got Kmart to open a store, and it was the largest selling Kmart store in their entire network. And Target looked at that and realized that they'd been avoiding these neighborhoods. You know, and, and Minneapolis is not a serious any inner city place, let me tell you. So <laughs> but then they began to realize there was a market there. And it's like the community people have done the same thing. They like to take the bankers and people on tours and say, come out to my neighborhood. You've never been to my neighborhood. You drive by it in your car to get to work, but you've never been in this neighborhood. And, you, and, and it's been like a conversion experience for a lot of the really good bankers we've worked with who come out there and realize what potential there was in those neighborhoods who'd never actually been there before. And, and, and I probably shouldn't say this about other colleagues, academic colleagues, but we need fewer economists making these decisions. <laughs> I mean, economists don't even believe there could be discrimination because it violates the rational man theory. I mean, you've got to have people trying to make these decisions who have seen the world, who go out there and talk to people and realize the potential. Because you're right, it's there. And over and over again, I've seen businesses find it, bankers find it, people go out in the neighborhoods. They have got to get their feet on the ground in the neighborhoods and see what the potential is. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Cummings, I, it's, uh, you know, this committee uh, uh, holds your participation in the highest regard because, um, as you state, you come from the inner city, the inner inner city. Mm -hmm. uh, I still live in the city and have uh, for most of my life in the city of Cleveland. And uh, I, I would imagine that uh, this Congress has changed dramatically over the last hundred years that there's probably not a lot of members that live in the inner city. And so, uh, you know, we might have an eye that's a little bit trained a little bit differently. You know, I represented the inner city and the city council, the inner uh, mayor of Cleveland, uh, state senate, Congress, have an inner city district, or a district that 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 includes the inner city. Uh, the when you get into issues like this that are that that have a powerful economic underpinning, uh, given the history of the United States, you cannot separate the economic realities from race. Mm -hmm. Of course, we understand that doesn't mean that poor white folks aren't dealing with the same problems, essentially, in terms of lack of access to credit. Matter of fact, the, the neighborhood that we looked at in Cleveland that had over 50 percent of failure of loans and, of course, a rapid rate of foreclosures um, happened to be predominantly Caucasian. Uh, and so there's a lot of poor people and uh, moderate income people in the same boat, whether they're white or black. The point, and, and, and you know, we, we understand that. Uh, <laughs> as, as Mr. Cummings is talking about Target, here, here's what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about all these people going to Target because that's the only place that might be available. <laughs> I'm thinking that all these, most of these goods are made in China. <laughs> And think about it, you know, buy a washing machine, a bicycle, textiles, plants close in the United States, not work here, unemployment rises, particularly in inner city areas. I mean, there, there is a cycle here. You know, you can't, it's interesting how you can get into an issue like uh, CRA and suddenly you can <laughs> go back to where the, where's the money and where's it going? Because what's happening, what's happening and what we're seeing here is, um, the wealth being distributed to the top in this country. Uh, banks are engines for, for the redistribution of the wealth, and the wealth goes upward. CRA is an engine for uh, a more equitable distribution. That's what it's about at its inception. The CRA doesn't work, that wealth still goes up, and not only that, but it'll accelerate upward if the cop is off the beat, which is what happened with the subprime loan, and people were just, uh, basically had their financial positions ransacked. Uh, so this committee, which is a domestic policy oversight subcommittee, uh, understands the, the linkages. 
<laughs> and uh, because there are. I want to uh, conclude uh, with a question to Mr. Van Toll and then see if we can, uh, if there's any final comments by any of the panelists. Mr. Van Toll, how has your participation in the CRA process decreased in the past seven years? Increased? Decreased. Decreased. <coughs> well, I, I think what we see happening with a lot of community groups, um, uh, we very actively work to keep involved in the process, but among many of our peer groups, and particularly smaller community development sort of groups, if they don't see that their efforts are having an effect with the regulators, they naturally drop off in their participation. Um, so is the participation process different uh, today than it was in 1997, 1987? Well, I think, I think during that, during the Clinton years, there was, uh, for a time, there was a, um, uh, an, an increase in people who were, or banks who were referred to the Justice Department. There was a feeling that, you know, taking action at the local level had real effects and that uh, you were doing something good for your community. When you start feel not seeing that happen anymore, if you're a busy person working for a community group, your natural inclination is to stop taking that action. If you, uh, I mean, it's, it's a counter, uh, it, it, it's not a good thing to do, but it's just a natural thing for people so to do. So, so if you uh, had, so if you had access to fair lending review of banks conducted by regulatory agencies, would that change participation? Would it be strengthened? Yeah, I think there's a whole series of ways if Congress would look at how to make the Community Reinvestment Act uh, more friendly to uh, the consumer groups, more friendly to people in the neighborhoods, uh, to make sure that the, it was mandated that during mergers there had to be a public meeting. You know, I mean, you could, uh, the, the groups, you know, represented on this table nationally could come up with a whole series of ways to make, uh, make to empower communities in the process. And, you know, that would be one, uh, you know, you could, uh, right now, if there's a, a negative uh, community reinvestment rating that a bank disagrees with, they have a right to appeal that within the, within the process. Uh, we as community groups don't get to see positive ratings and have a right to appeal them downward. So the, the deck is stacked in a lot of ways in favor of the lending institutions and against the community groups. And I think you know, Congress could look at all of the ways that that happens and restack the deck so that if there's a more level playing field, we would feel more empowered, we'd get more involved in the process, and I think benefits would accrue to everyone. Well, each of the panelists uh, has experience on this, and some of you in your written testimony have outlined uh, improvements that you would recommend be made in the Community Reinvestment Act. Uh, and in light of the, um, uh, the Gra Graham uh, Leach Lilly, uh, it would be good to you know, and some of you have done that, but I think it's good to inspect the implications of that mm -hmm. and what might be able to be done to strengthen the Community Investment Act or to change, or to change that law as well. Uh, I would ask each of you uh, if there is, um, uh, based on what you've heard today from the regulators, if there is anything that you would like to submit for the record in terms of follow-up comment or analysis or recommendations for um, for legislative initiatives or reforms or any area for further inquiry that this committee might look into. Because again, this committee has a very broad reach and uh, there has not been uh, any regulatory enforcement uh, in, in broad areas of our economy for quite a while. Uh, this subcommittee intends to change that. So you, you can be of, of uh, continued assistance in, in our work, and we are open to hearing your suggestions about what we might be able to do uh, with respect to the Community Reinvestment Act, to um, uh, Graham Leach-Bliley, 
to any area that relates to um, your expertise in, in housing and access to credit uh, or anything else that, that might touch on, on the areas that you have familiarity with. So I would just let each of you know I would invite you to continue to uh, stay in touch with the subcommittee and to give us the uh, opportunity of your expertise in this and to thank you for your commitment to community. Uh, this is, um, uh, each of you have reflected a, a, a long-term commitment uh, when you, I'm sure, when you see the staggering toll that's taken on families uh, in this subprime mortgage failure and you see the lack of enforcement of the CRA, uh, it's, um, it can be very discouraging. But I think we can change that. And, and that's actually what the work of this committee is about, by bringing the truth to light and giving people a chance to you know, look at what's happening. Uh, are there any, uh, before I conclude the work of this committee for the day, uh, is, uh, do any of you have any uh, final comments that you want to make? Uh, and, uh, you know, feel free to right now. Anything, anybody want to say anything? I, I, I'd just like to, I think, emphasize one point. I hope, you know, as you look at CRA reform, this whole issue of assessment areas desperately needs review because that system is currently broken. Um, you know, you heard some of the statistics from, from Jim about lending. In terms of business lending, the same thing is happening. Uh, I look at rural counties of upstate New York, and about 75% of the loans going into those rural counties now are credit card loans from the, the urban center credit card lenders with no assessment areas in those, in those counties. Uh, you know, that, that same donut that you saw for Detroit you could take, for many lenders, you could look at the cities across America and all the rural areas in between that are left out of assessment areas because they get jumped over. So, 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 so there you could take the uh, amount of credit card loans that are going into rural areas and you could probably juxtapose it with uh, bankruptcy uh, statistics. Oh yeah, I'm sure you could. And, it, and it's just a, a problem of having assessment areas tied to deposit-taking branches rather than to where the institutions are actually doing so business. So if the institutions aren't out there to loan, then what happens is that uh, the next line of credit is a credit card. Right. And you also have, and staff and I were talking earlier about the issue of marketing, you also have the extraordinary aggressive marketing of credit card companies. I mean, just extraordinary. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. You know, I mean, I, I cut up most of my credit cards years <laughs> ago because I started to see the uh, impact that it can quickly have on somebody's budget. But if that's the only way you can get, mo you can get access to, to money, yeah. uh, you're stuck. So that, that's, a, that's an interesting area that uh, this uh, subcommittee could go into. And I'd like, you know, again, I'd invite your comments on that and, and any guidance that you'd have on the issue of assessment. Okay. Uh, how might we strengthen that. Anyone else on the uh, panel before, and thank you. J just one, one quick comment, which is I think the Community Reinvestment Act works best when it empowers communities, and that has uh, been most seen through community CRA challenges to bank merger applications, and that w what resulted in the most sorts of innovative, affordable lending programs. But in recent years, the, no the number of CRA challenges seem to have diminished dramatically, and I think there are um, two reasons for that. One is that rather than th the regulators actually during the 90s used to push banks to reach these agreements uh, with groups, and um, they would let negotiations proceed while the communities were negotiating with the banks and agreements would emerge, and they were terrific. They, they included monitoring provisions and reporting requirements. And all, all. But banks then started to make these unilateral commitments, and the agencies accepted them. So, you know, they weren't negotiated. They don't have monitoring. They don't, they just sort of say, this is what we'll do, and then they report on their progress. And those, that, that really takes the, uh, the steam out of CRA challenges. The and the second point is the national scope of banks. It's very hard to make a challenge when there are 150 metropolitan areas that the bank serves. It's, it's overwhelming. And it actually, you heard before, w w you know, one of the comments was, well, if a bank is discriminating in one assessment area but not the others, well, what are we going to do about that? Well, you know, that's the same kind of attitude I find with CRA challenges. It might not be lending well in one area, but, well, it has 150 areas, so what can we do? So I think putting some 
power back in the CRA challenges would be a very important way to, to make the CRA work better. Just, I would just say very quickly that the inclusion of non-depository affiliates of banks being covered under CRA as a mandatory necessity, uh, as well as reforming the assessment area, and then also uh, requiring that there be a direct focus on lending to minority households and communities would go a long way toward, if not enforcing, certainly providing the kinds of information that would make it very difficult to hide and run away from the reality of what's happening through major financial institutions as it respects disenfranchised uh, communities and households. Yeah, I would just add, um, I think you have to review the fair lending exam process itself. We do a lot of consulting with lenders and we look at their, their own lending regulations and guidelines and I can tell you if any lender showed me the federal guidelines, they would be in a heap of trouble in terms of, of their ability to actually control discrimination. They're really kind of disgraceful. They're, they're kind of disgraceful. They, they don't really cover marketing, which is the main way in which subprime lending deceives people. They don't, they don't cover underwriting practices. They just say look at underwriting, but they don't describe to people how they're supposed to look at that and what to do. They d their statistical analysis only works if you've got a lot of actual minorities who applied. So if you're good enough to get no minorities to apply, you're exempt from their statistical analysis. And it, it's an absurd uh, system of target. And also, they only target one focal point, they call it or two focal points. So, so even though they examine a bank, they'll sort of pick, well, this, this year we'll look at um, marketing. Uh, next year we'll look at loans to single family homes. Instead of looking at the entire package, there's no way in the world that a, that a decent lender who were trying to do their own internal process would ever set up a, uh, a set of guidelines like that. Well, this, uh, this has been a uh, very informative hearing of this uh, domestic policy subcommittee and I, I want to uh, I want to thank the members of the panel for their participation I want to uh, note as I did at the beginning of the hearing that uh, the gentleman from California the ranking uh, member Mr. Issa was called to California because of the, um, uh, the, the very serious matter of the fires in in that state and in proximity uh, to his um, district. And uh, with his um, generous consent, we were able to move forward because our rules, um, unless we have a cooperative uh, participation here, doesn't, this doesn't work. But he made that possible and I want to thank him and wish uh, uh, the people of California and his constituents uh, well as they contend with this uh, outbreak of fires. This is the Domestic Policy Subcommittee of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. Our hearing today began at 2 o'clock. It's uh, nearing 6 o'clock on the issue of withholding the spirit of the Community Reinvestment Act. Do community Reinvestment Act ratings accurately reflect bank practices. Uh, our first panel had uh, Ms. Sandra Thompson, who is the Director of the Division of Supervision and Consumer Protection of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Ms. Sandra Bronstein, who is the Director of Division of Consumer and Community Affairs, Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. Ms. Montrese Yakimov, Managing Director for Compliance and Consumer Protection, Office of Thrift Supervision. Ms. Ann uh, Yedeke, Deputy Controller for Compliance Policy, Comptroller of the Currency. And of course, the distinguished uh, gentlemen who are uh, in, in front of us, uh, Panel 2, Calvin uh, Branford, Board Member, National Training and Information Center, Mr. James Carr, Chief Operating Officer, National Community Reinvestment Coalition, uh, Professor uh, Richard Mar Marsico, Professor of Law, New York Law School, Director of the Justice Action Center, and uh, Mr. Hubert Van Toll, Director, Economic Justice, Rural Opportunities Incorporated. Uh, this has been a, a very meaningful hearing. I want to thank Congressman Davis and uh, Congressman Cummings for their participation. This committee will continue to uh, delve deeply into uh, this issue and the economic implications for uh, millions of families. Uh, again, thank you to members of the panel. This committee is adjourned. Thank you. And thank the staff, too, very much.